Okay, so we're starting chapter six today. We're doing section 6.1, uh, discrete random variables. So let me tell you, section 6.1 is a tough section and the lecture today is gonna be very long. Um, so get ready. So just be ready, focus really hard. And this is a very important section because it's about random variables and we need to really understand what those are. And once we understand what those are, they're gonna be in the class the rest of the semester. Okay, so if you're like, I just don't understand random variables. Well, you're gonna, that means you're gonna have a little bit more trouble understanding everything that we do for the rest of the semester. So you really gotta understand this. Okay, now the way I give the lecture on random variables is in two parts. So the first hour is gonna be on what is a random variable, okay? And then the second hour is gonna be things that, some things that we do with random variables. Okay, so we got kind of two sections to this lecture. So in the first like hour or so of this lecture, what I need to get uh, through to you is actually like three things, I guess. Uh, well, the first thing is that every probability problem, let me write this down, every probability problem can be thought of as drawing once from a bag. And every probability, every probability problem says you're about to do something. Like you're about to draw, you have a bag and you're about to draw from the bag. You're about to flip a coin. You're about to draw a card out of a deck of cards. You're about to play roulette. Uh, maybe you're gonna draw things out of a bag more than once. We've done problems in here where you draw things out of a bag. Here's a bag, we're gonna draw, we're about to draw one time out of the bag find some events, find some probabilities. So we've done problems like that before. But what I'm trying to tell you is get really good at that kind of problem, drawing once from a bag. Get really good at that kind of probability question, which they're easy, they're not that hard, drawing once out of a bag, it's really easy. And then once you're good at that, every other probability problem, if it doesn't say, here's a bag, you're gonna draw once from the bag, I can forget what the problem actually says and pretend it said you're gonna draw once from the bag. So every problem, even though we've done so many different experiments in here, uh, there's so many different things we're doing, like we're drawing cards, flipping coins, things like this, they all can be thought of as one problem. So we really just learned one problem. You have a bag and you're gonna draw one time out of the bag, find some events, find some probabilities. So every problem can be thought of like that. So that's the first part I need to get across to you, okay? So every probability problem, can be thought of as drawing once from a bag. That's what it says over here. Every probability problem is equivalent to drawing once from a bag. Here, let's do a drawing once from a bag problem real quick. So experiment, we're gonna draw once from the bag that I'm gonna draw down here. We'll put the numbers one, two, three, four, five, and six in there. Okay, and then I could say uh, E is the event that you draw an even number. F is the event that you draw a number uh, larger than one. Okay, so if I just said this, so the experiment is we're about to put our hand in, in the bag and draw one time out of the bag. And here's some events, okay? So E is the event you draw an even number, F is the event you draw a number larger than one. Then let's find some things. I could say find E. Remember that's an event, so you're gonna make a list. So curly brackets, and you'll list the even number. So what goes on this list? Two, four, six. Yes, okay. And if I said find the probability you're gonna draw an even number, well, you would use the absolute value formula. It goes like this. And then absolute value of E means count how many things are in E. So there's three things in there, right? And then absolute value of S, what's absolute value of S? Remember one, S two, three, oh wait, six? Yes, so S is one, two, three, four, five, six, but absolute value of S is six. It's just, absolute value of S means count how many things are in here. Okay, so that's how you do a problem like that. Here, let's do another one. The point is, when the problem gives you a bag and says you're gonna draw once out of the bag, all the questions are really easy, you just because you can see the bag, you can see the contents of the bag, and we can do all these problems. Here, let's do F real quick. So let's find F, that's an event again. It says you draw a number larger than one. What goes in there? Two, three, four, five, six. Okay. 
And if I ask you for probability of f, again, the formula goes like this. Absolute value of f over absolute value of s. All right, tell me the answer to that. Five over six. Yeah, you're all saying the answer. That's good. That means it's easy, right? Okay, five out of six. Awesome. Okay, so that's how you do a problem where it says you're going to draw once out of a bag. Okay, so again, I hope everyone agrees. If you're just drawing once, I know we've done problems where you draw more than once with replacement, without replacement, all that stuff. But if you're just drawing once, the problem is pretty easy. And now what I'm trying to tell you is any other problem, any other problem can be thought of as drawing once out of a bag. Here, let me give you another problem. Let's say the problem says you're going to flip a coin twice. So that's the experiment. So you're about to flip a coin twice. Well, there's no bag involved in this problem. What I'm saying is you can think about the problem differently. Instead of thinking of flipping a coin twice, you can imagine instead that um, this is equivalent to drawing once from some bag. Every experiment is equivalent to drawing once from some bag. I gotta figure out what the bag looks like. Well, what you do is you think about flipping a coin twice and you think of all the different outcomes when you flip a coin twice and you just put them in the bag. So take all the outcomes from this and put them in the bag. And then you could forget this and just imagine we're drawing out of a bag. If you flip a coin twice, one result would be heads, heads. In the first and second coin land on heads. Another result would be heads, tails. Another result would be tails, heads. Another result would be tails, tails. So flipping a coin twice or drawing once from this bag here, those are equivalent. What do I mean by they're equivalent? What's the difference? There's only one difference. The difference is there's actually a coin involved here versus there's actually a bag involved over here. Okay, but there's no other difference. If I say, what are, if I say what's the sample space? You're going to list heads, 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 tails, tails, heads, tails, tails, no matter which way you're thinking about the problem. If I say find some events, find some probabilities, you're going to get the same answer no matter which way you're thinking about the problem. So that's a very important point, okay, that any experiment, any uh, probability problem, you can, you can rephrase it and make it drawing out of some bag. Okay, and then I'm going to ask you more questions. Like, for example, E could be the event that uh, both coins land on the same thing. So then I can ask you, what is this event? Remember, it's an event, it's a list. You put curly brackets. So both, both coins land on the same thing would be like heads, heads. They both landed on heads uh, or would be tails, tails. And again, you could think of a coin if you want, or you could just look in this bag and go, hmm, well, that time it's the same thing. That time it's the same thing kind of thing. And then again, we could find the probability of the event. And if you use the absolute value formula, it goes like this. Absolute value of E is how many things are in E, which is two. Absolute value of S is how many things are in S. You can look here and you see there's four. Okay, so let me say everything that I've said again. Every probability problem, they're gonna say, you're gonna do some experiment. You're gonna flip a coin once or more than once. You're gonna draw a card out of a deck once or more than once. You're gonna draw out of a bag once or more than once with replacement, without replacement. Or you're gonna play roulette or, you know, there's so many different uh, experiments you could do. But what I'm trying to tell you is they're all really the same experiment. They're all really drawing once out of a bag. Okay, so if you like bag problems, so like bag problems, and drawing only once. You don't even have to draw more than once. So if, as long as you like that problem, drawing once out of a bag, get really good at that kind of problem, and then every other problem can be thought of as drawing once out of a bag. The only thing is you need to know what the contents of the bag are. So what goes in the bag? If they don't give you a bag and a problem, what is this bag that we're thinking about, right? The bag we're thinking about is, well, you just take whatever experiment they give you and take all the outcomes and put them in a bag. And now we can pretend we're just drawing out of that bag. Okay, you guys getting that idea? Yes. All right, cool. So that's the first thing that I need to convey to you. Now the next thing, so we're gonna talk about what a random variable is now. The thing is, a bag, drawing once out of a bag is fantastic, but there's one thing that I'm not gonna like. And the thing I don't like is I want the, the bag to have numbers in it, okay? Like the first, here, let me go back. The first example we did, the bag had numbers in it. Fantastic. But the second bag over here does not have numbers in it. It has like, you know, letters, right? It has two letters. Each outcome is two letters, not numbers. I want the bag to only have numbers in it. 
Okay. Why do I want that to happen? Because we're going to um, be doing calculations involving the outcomes. We're going to do arithmetic involving the outcomes. Like if you look at the top one over here, if I say, okay, you draw the number two out of the bag, and then the next time you draw the number five, let's add, what do you get? You can add them, no problem, you get seven. But over here, if you say, well, the first time you draw out of the bag, you get heads, heads. Second time you draw out of the bag, you get tails, heads. Now add these. You're like, huh? That doesn't make sense because you add numbers. Okay, you don't add what's heads, heads, plus tails, heads. It doesn't make sense. So what we want is we want the bag to have numbers. So every problem, problem can be thought of as drawing one side of a bag. So every problem is, has been boiled down to one kind of problem now, drawing out of a bag. But I want to go one step further. I want the things that are in the bag to be numbers. If they're numbers, fantastic. What do you do if they're not numbers? The answer is you change the names, okay? So right now, if you look at this bottom bag, the names of the outcomes are heads, 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 tails, tails, heads, tails, tails. Those are just names, okay? And the names are not numbers. So if the names are not numbers, what are you gonna do? You're gonna change the names. You change the names of the outcomes and make them numbers. And that's what a random variable is. It just changes the names of the outcomes and makes them numbers. Which outcomes do we need to change the names of? All of them, I need everything that's in the bag to be a number when I'm done. Okay, so if I look over here, um, here, let me give you a quick example. So back to this uh, flipping a coin four times thing, we could think of this as the original, so the sample space, this is the original bag that we're drawing out of. So heads, 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 tails, tails, heads, tails, tails. And what we're gonna do is we're going to change the names and create a new bag. It's gonna look just like the old bag, except the names are gonna be different. Now, how do you change the names? Your job, okay? Like on the quiz, for example, you'll get a problem. We'll do an example in a couple minutes uh, where we practice this a lot. But besides this example, on the quiz, you'll get one question where I'm gonna give you an experiment. I'm gonna say, make up a random variable. When I say make up a random variable, what I'm asking you is, give me a way you need to write a verbal description or just, I don't know, but you have to make it very clear. And when I read your answer, it has to explain to me how to take all of these outcomes and change them to numbers. Let me give you a quick example. I could say X, so we'll use X for the variable. X is gonna be the, the, the number of H symbols in the outcome. In other words, what I'm saying is, what's the new name? The old name, like this outcome here, the old name is heads, heads. The new name, we're gonna call this bag X. The new name is gonna, this is explaining how to get the new name. It's saying, just take the old name and count how many head symbols you have. We have two head symbols there. So the new name of that outcome is gonna be two. So heads, heads got changed to the number two. It's just, I just changed the name, that's all I did. Okay, but this little description here will help me figure out how to change all the names. Let's go to this one. What's the new name for this one? For heads, tails? One. The new name is one. We used to call that outcome heads, tails. Now we're calling it one. Yeah. Okay, this one over here, same thing. This is telling me how to change the names. It's the number of head symbols. How many head symbols do you see? One. One. And for the last one, what's the new name for the last one? You kind of cut out, but I think you said it right. So zero, yeah. Yeah, take a look at the bags. What's the difference? There's four things in the bag. There's four things in the bag here, but the bag on the right has numbers in it and that's what I want, okay? It's like changing names. Like let's say you wanted to go and change your name. You'd have to go, I don't know where you go exactly, but you go like City Hall or something, whatever, and you fill out some papers, right? And then you'll change your name. And the thing is, when you change your name, uh, the old name that you had is there's still a record of it somewhere. So if I, I, I don't know where, do you go to city hall? I don't know. Let's say you go there. So you go to city hall and, uh, if I had to look up what your old name was, it'll be there. Okay. So it's not like we forget the old name, but we're changing the names from, from some names to some other names, but I want the new names to be numbers. Let me give you another example. Let's say, um, right now you guys all have names. Okay. And let's say the experiment is I'm going to randomly select one of the students in this class. Well, if I randomly select a student in the class, the outcomes are names, it's your name, okay? But I don't want the outcome to be a name, I want it to be, I mean, I want the outcome to be a number. So I could say, okay, 
I want to, we're going to change all your names and I have to give you a way to do that. I could say, okay, everybody's name has been changed and now it's your age. So whatever your age is, that's your name now. Okay. So like if your name before was uh, Jack, let's say, okay. So your name was Jack and the per Jack is 20 years old. Now the person's name is 20. So that's the idea. And every single student has to have their name changed. And I say, okay, just use their age or you can use other things. Use your social security number, use your student ID number, use your PIN number, use your height, your weight, your uh, whatever, you know, but the point is uh, like your zip code or something. But just, I have to say, okay, here's a way to describe how to take every, every outcome and change the names and make them numbers. That's the idea. And we'll ultimately end up with a bag with numbers and every probability problem can be thought of as drawing one time out of this bag of numbers. This is what we want to accomplish in this first part of the lecture, right? We want every probability problem to be equivalent to drawing a number from a bag and only once. So, so drawing once from a bag and we want it, the, num the things in the bag to be numbers. Okay, so we don't want them to be anything but numbers. We want the outcomes to be numbers. So if the outcomes are not numbers, what do we do? We relabel them, we change the names. Which outcomes do we change the names to? All of them, I gotta make sure they're all numbers when I'm done. Okay, and that's what a random variable is. A random variable is a way of relabeling all the outcomes with numbers. So you relabel all the outcomes of the experiment with numbers. You see, there were two outcomes, this one and this one, whose new names were the same. That's totally fine. And again, if I said, I'm gonna change everybody's name in this class to your age, well, if there's um, more than one 20 year old, then there's more than one person with the same new name. Okay, so that's totally fine. When you change the names, different people can end up with the same new name. That's totally fine. Okay, so don't let that bother you. So now we're at the point of doing an example. Okay, so let's take a look at this example. So example one, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you a bunch of experiments and we're gonna define some random variables on the experiment. We're gonna take our time on this because I wanna really make sure we understand this. So let's do part A. So in this experiment, we're flipping a coin four times. When I give you an experiment, the very first thing you should do is make sure you completely understand the experiment and understand what the outcomes look like. So the experiment is, in this example, flipping a coin four times. Somebody give me an outcome, any outcome of this experiment. Heads, 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 heads. Okay, good, heads, 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 heads. So that's wonderful. That means you completely understand the experiment and you understand what the outcomes look like. A lot of times when I ask the question that I just asked, a student will say heads. If you just say heads and that's all you say, then do you understand that we're flipping four times? You see what I'm saying? You got to tell me after you flipped four times what the result was. So you got to give me all four flips. If you just write heads, then it sounds like you think we're flipping once or you're just confused about something. So this is good. Okay, so heads, heads, heads is an outcome. Okay, uh, somebody give me another outcome of this experiment. Heads, heads, tails, tails. Okay, heads, heads, tails, tails. And anyway, there's lots of them. And what I need to do is I need to change all the names to numbers. The old names are, are what I call the outcomes, and the new names are gonna be the value of your variable. That's what I call it, the value of the variable. That's, just think of that as the new name. So I could change the name to anything I want. So I could say, I want to make this a nine. Why nine? You don't want nine? Pick another number. It doesn't matter. Change the name to anything you want. Change the name of this to anything you want. Like I can make it three. But I got to do this for all the outcomes. Okay, so I got to do a little bit better job here. But that's the idea. Okay, we have all, all these outcomes. There's actually 16 different outcomes for this experiment. I got to change all those names to 16 new names. That's the idea. All right. Now I'm gonna show you, we're gonna do a bunch of examples here. It says to find some random variables on the following experiment. So I'm gonna make up lots of variables on this experiment, but let me just say one more thing as far as the quiz goes. Even though I'm gonna make up like five or so examples for each one, on a quiz, I only want you to give me one example. I'm gonna say, okay, here's an experiment, make up your own random variable on this experiment. Just give me one example. The reason why is because if you give me two, sometimes students will give me two different ones because they're not sure, you know, then, and one of them is right and one of them is wrong, then you're gonna lose points because it tells me you don't completely get it yet, okay? 
So long story short, if you give me a, a correct one and an incorrect one, I'm going to grade the incorrect one. Uh, but and you're going to be like, oh my God, he's mean. But no, I'm not. I mean, I, okay, maybe I am. But the point is that uh, you're showing me you don't completely understand it. So that's why you have to lose points. So long story short, just give me, so understand it and then just give me one example. Okay, but anyway, so here's the first example. So the first way I'm gonna do is the way I don't suggest you do it, but this way definitely always works. The problem with this first way is it's kind of long. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna call, I'm gonna write X. It's a random variable. We usually use letters around X. So I'm gonna use X. And I'm gonna basically, this is a big curly bracket over here, okay? And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, okay, I'm gonna basically list all the outcomes of this experiment of flipping a coin four times. And I'm gonna tell you what we're gonna change the name to. So <clears throat> if the outcome is heads, 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 I'm gonna change the name of this. I gotta change the name to something. I'm gonna change it to five. I can change it to any number I want. Make sure you understand what I wrote there. X is equal to five if the outcome is heads, heads, heads. Okay, so this is the outcome of the experiment. And this over here is the new name. Okay, that's the new name. Uh, my W looks a little weird. That's the new name, okay? So outcome is this. The new name, we're gonna call it X. So if you flip a coin four times and the outcome is heads, 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 the new name is five, and I'm gonna say X is equal to five. Okay, so X stands for the new name. Outcome means old name. Okay, now I'm not done because that's only one outcome. I have to get all the outcomes of this experiment relabeled. So what I have to do is I have to list them all. So here, here's another one, heads, 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 tails. That's another outcome. I'm gonna change this to a number, any number I want. Let's say three. Okay, let's do it again. Uh, basically, I need every single outcome written here. Let me put four of them for now. Um, let's change this one to one. Let's change this one to negative four. When you change the outcomes to a number, they can be negative, they can be fractions, decimals. They can be any number at all. Uh, okay, but again, I'm still not done because this is only four outcomes of the experiment. I have to relabel them all. So let's keep going. So if the outcome is heads, heads, no. Heads, tails, heads, 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 tails, heads, tails. Heads, tails, tails, heads. Heads, tails, tails, tails. Those are half of the outcomes. Those are all the outcomes that start with the head symbol. And again, I'm just going to change all their names to numbers. So two, four, one, one. You can use the same number more than once. I would normally keep this list going because I'm kind of out of room. I'm going to write the rest of it over here. When you write this on a quiz, if you do it this way, don't make two lists like this. Just make one long list. All right, let's keep going. Uh, so let's say seven if the outcome is tails, heads, heads, heads. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to write down all these outcomes again, but every first symbol I'm going to put tails. Uh, so tails, heads, heads, heads. If the outcome is tails, heads, heads, tails. Outcome is tails, heads, tails, heads. Tails, heads, tails, tails. Anyway, you notice that this is kind of annoying because listing them all, there's a lot to list. Tails, 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 heads, and then tails, 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 tails. So there, I listed every single outcome. And now I'm going to tell you what we're changing the name to. So one, five, negative two, negative eight. It doesn't matter, okay? But four, seven, 13. You change the names to, to outcomes. So if you wrote this on a quiz, this is completely clear because now I'm going to think, okay, let me make up an outcome. Like, let's say the outcome. I'll just pick a specific outcome, like heads, tails, tails, heads. And I want to figure out what's the new name. Okay. And we'll look here and we'll go heads, tails, tails, heads. Oh, there it is. The new name is one. Okay. So the, the old outcome was not a number and now we're changing the name and we're calling it one. That's the new name. You got to make sure every outcome is relabeled. Okay. So that's one way of doing it. Okay. Any questions on this much? Okay, before I give you some other ways, I'm gonna give you some better ways now because this is kind of a long way to do it, but this works. But again, you had to list 16 things here and another problem might be way more than 16 things. So this is definitely not the best way to do it, uh, but this is one way to do it. Okay, somebody give me, just so I'm, I wanna make sure we're clear between what outcome means and what the new name is. 
Okay, so somebody give me an outcome, one outcome, besides the one I wrote over here, one outcome of this experiment. The first one's tails and then three heads. Okay, so that's an outcome. When I'm saying outcome, that's an outcome. And then if I say, what's the value of X? I'm basically asking, what's the new name? Then you look at my, what I've labeled here, let's see, there it is, tails, tail, tails, heads, heads, heads. The new name is set, or so, okay, I'll just write seven over here. So the value of X is seven. So, okay, so the way I would word it is outcome, value of X. Outcome is the old name, value of X is the new name. Okay, somebody give me a possible value of X in this, the way I've defined X here. Three. Three. Okay. Uh, and is there any outcome where the, the value of X is three? Yes. What is it? Heads, 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 tails. Right. So again, this is an outcome. And the new name, the value of X is three. Okay. Any questions so far? Okay. So now let me give you another way of uh, making up random variables. This is one example. I'm going to erase it because I'm out of room and I need to write more. So I'm going to write a whole bunch of examples so we get comfortable with this. Um, so what you're going to do is the following. You got to make sure of two things. First of all, you have to make sure every outcome got relabeled. You don't accidentally miss one. And you got to make sure that you don't relabel one accidentally with more than one number. The way you do it is um, you take advantage of the fact that you're allowed to use the same number for different outcomes. So the idea is you group the outcomes together, okay? And you say, for every outcome in this group, we'll change all of those to like the number five. Then for a different group, we'll change all of those to the number two, and so on. So I'm gonna erase this in a couple seconds, but for example, these are all the outcomes that start with the head symbol. So I could change all of those to the number. This is a different group of outcomes. I could change all of those. Those are all the outcomes where the first flip is tails and change all those to a number. So here's another way to do it. This is more along the lines of what I would want you to do. I'll call this Y just to distinguish it from the X that we had before. So I'm gonna write something like Y is equal to seven if the first flip is heads and three if the first flip is tails. And that would be it. That covers every outcome right there. And it was a lot less writing. Because every outcome, the first flip is either gonna be heads or tails, okay? So basically what we're saying in this example here is, um, I know we're flipping the coin four times, but I'm just gonna look at the first flip, and if it's heads, we're gonna call the whole outcome seven. If it's tails, we're gonna call the whole outcome three. Is everybody clear? Or here, let me just make sure this is clear. So here, I'll give you a couple of outcomes. And I want you to tell me the value of X. So let's say the outcome is heads, heads, tails, heads. What's the value of X for that one? Seven. Seven. Because you just look at the first flip. First flip is heads, so it's a seven. That's right. Here, let's do another one. Let's say it's heads, tails, tails, tails. What's the outcome for that one? I'm sorry, that is the outcome. What's the value of X for that one? What's the new name? Seven. Seven again. Again, the first flip is heads, so we're changing it to seven. All right, what if it's tails, heads, heads, tails? What's the value of X for that one? Three. Three. It's three, yeah, because the first flip is tails. If the first flip is tails, we're changing the name to three. And again, that covers every possible outcome. Because no matter what the outcome is, the first symbol is either going to be heads or tails. And based on if it's heads or tails, you get a value of X over here. Okay, so that's the idea. Um, again, this, this is a group of outcomes. All the outcomes where the first flip is heads. This is another group of outcomes where the first flip is tails. And every outcome belongs to one of those. So you cover all the bases with that. And then just change. This says everything in this group changes to a seven. Everything in this group changes to a three. Okay, so that's what's happening there. Um, when you do it this way, here's what you want. So a few things. First of all, 
again, this is a group of outcomes. This is a group of outcomes. You want to make sure that every outcome is in one of the groups, which it is. And the other thing is you want to make sure that these things are disjoint. Disjoint means there's nothing in both. Because if there's something in both, if there was an outcome that was in both groups, then you've changed that outcome to seven and three, and you don't want to change the name more than once. So for example, so this, this example is great. Now I'm gonna give you one that's not so great. So this is gonna be a bad example, but let me write something like this. So, uh, and this is also a little bit more advice. If you're dealing with something like this where you're flipping a coin, if the very first thing you write down talks about only the first flip, then you should focus on the first flip only the whole time. So you don't wanna do something like this, like three, if the first flip is heads, four, if the second flip is heads, uh, you know, five, if the third flip, this is really bad. You don't wanna do something like this. You don't wanna change flips. If you're talking about the first flip only, you should talk about the first flip the whole way, why? Because if you do something like this, where this is talking about just the first flip, this is talking about just the second flip, now there's overlap. Like for example, in this one, let's say your outcome is heads, heads, tails, heads. Is the first flip heads here? Yes. So what is this changing to? Well, this is changing to number three, because the first flip is heads, because it belongs to this group, all the outcomes where the first flip is heads. Okay, for this outcome, is the second flip heads? Yeah, there it is. So what are we changing it to? Well, this says change it to four. We can't have that, okay? You can't change the outcome to more than one thing. Okay, so long story short, you don't want the different groups. You don't want the same outcome to belong to more than one of your groups. So you wanna make sure they're disjoint. The other problem with what I have written here is, what about like tails, 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 tails? First flip is not heads. Second flip is not heads. Third flip is not heads. So what are we relabeling this with? We haven't relabeled it. Okay, so again, that's the, those are the two things you wanna make sure of when you write your answer. Every outcome has to get relabeled. See, like here, this one didn't even get relabeled. And we don't want this situation. We don't wanna relabel the same outcome with two different numbers. Okay, so you want the groups here to basically take care of every possible outcome and you want them to be disjoint, is the idea. Okay, so this is a bad example, but I'm gonna leave it there. As far as your studying goes, I'll just cross it out so you know that that will not be a good example. Let's try to come up with one or two more and then we'll go on to another experiment. Any questions so far? All right, uh, let's do, um, I'm running out of letters, let's, let's call this one W. So another thing you can do is you can say like, um, instead of focusing on just the first flip or the just, see how this is the first flip? You could focus on just the second flip instead. So you could have done something like W is, you know, five if the second flip is heads and three if the second flip is tails. So you could just focus on the second flip the entire time. As long as if you're focusing on the second flip only, you focus on the second flip only the second time around. That's something else you could do. Um, let's do T. You could do something like this. You could look at the first and last flip. So like five, if the first and last flip are the same. What do I mean by that? I mean, if it looks like tails, heads, heads, tails, first and last are the same, or like heads, heads, tails, heads, first and last are the same. So those two outcomes and all the other ones where this and this match will be changed to a five. And then you would say, so notice in this way, in, in this part here, I'm focusing on just the first and last. If I'm focusing on just the first and last, then you should focus on the first and last for all of them. If the first is tails and the last flip, Heads. So what I was saying earlier is if you're focusing on the first and last, then focus on the first and last all the way through. Don't change to another flip. The reason you don't want to change to another flip is it'll cause overlap. It'll make the groups not disjoint and then that'll cause problems. So this is the first and last are the same. This one is the first is tails and the last is heads. 
What have I not talked about yet? So you've got to tell me about the first and the last. The first is whatever, and the last is whatever. Tell me. If the first is heads and the last is tails. Right, that's the only thing left. And you change that to a number, again, any number you want, like zero or something like that. Cool, okay, uh, any questions so far? Um, I have a question. Go ahead. So, can we do like five if the first and last are the same, and then can we just do like a different number if the first and last are different? Of course. Or does it have to be that's, like... That's fine too. Okay. There's lots of ways you can do it, yes. So yeah, that's totally fine. Um, any other questions so far? Okay, let me put one more over here. Let me call it um, W. No, did we have a W already? I think we did. Let's do V. But again, usually you want to use letters around X. Usually we'll just use X, but if I'm making up lots of examples, then I'll use different letters. Um, okay, so the last one could be something like uh, what you might care about. Eventually the random variable is gonna be, okay, you flip the coin four times, but what do you care about? Maybe you care about how many times it landed on head. So you can write V is equal to the, the total number of times the coin landed on heads. Notice it's a verbal description here, but when I read your verbal description, I need a lot. What do I need? First of all, I need to make sure it's clear to you that you know what the experiment is. Okay, so we're flipping a coin four times. Because sometimes people will say like, for this example, they'll say like one for heads and two for tails. And I'm like, well, heads is not an outcome, so it doesn't make sense what you're saying, okay? But if you said one for heads, 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 now I know you get the, the experiment. We're flipping the coin four times. So that's the first thing, okay? And then I gotta make sure that every outcome gets relabeled and no outcome gets relabeled more than once. And this takes care of every, just that much, you just write that much, that takes care of every flip. Like for example, for this one, um, let me write down a couple of outcomes so we make sure you understand what it says here. The out, some outcomes and then write the value of, instead of X, I'll write value of the variable V. So let's say the, the outcome is heads, tails, heads, heads. What is the value, oops, what is the value of this variable? Or what's the new name of this outcome according to this way of changing the names? What's three. The name? Three. It's just gonna count the number of head symbols. Yeah. Oh, there's three head symbols. Here, let's do it again. Let's say the outcome is heads, tails, tails, tails. What's the value of V this time? One. Okay, how about this one? What if it's tails, 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 tails? What's the value of V? Zero. Zero, yeah. So again, old names, new names, and there's lots of ways of doing it. Now, please make sure you guys understand, I'm, I gave you like five examples or so on this experiment here, but on a quiz, I usually just want one. If I only ask for one, only give me one, okay? Give me one example, don't give me five different variables. The reason why I'm saying that is because if you give me more than one answer and one's right and one's wrong, then I'm not gonna be certain that you understand things, then you're gonna lose points. So long story short, I grade the wrong one. But it sounds mean, like, oh, he's going to grade the wrong one. Well, it's because if you wrote a wrong one, I, you're not, it's not clear that you get it yet, okay? So long story short, only give me one example. But I'm doing a bunch of examples right now because we're learning it, okay? So we can make sure we understand what's happening. Okay, let's move on to another experiment. So next one. Draw a single card from a deck of cards. Okay. So again, you think about what the outcomes are. And I want to change the names to numbers. Now, if you make a list, this would take forever. You'd have to list all 52 cards. And then for each card, change the name to a number. I don't want to do that. That's way too long. So instead, what you're going to do is you're going to group the cards. You're going to say, okay, these cards, I'm changing the name to this. These cards, I'm changing the name to this, and so on. All right. I want someone to try. I know it's not the easiest thing in the world, but it's not that hard once you start to get it. So... Be like, okay, so make up some groups of outcomes. Like for this group of outcomes, I'm changing all the, number, all the names to this number. For this group, I'm changing it to this number, and so on. Someone try it. Can we group all... them into like hearts and... Yeah, try it. 
So here, let me start you out then. So you can say something like nine if the card is a heart. So all the hearts got changed to nine. So jack of hearts, ace of hearts, four of hearts, nine of hearts, any of the hearts, the cards that have a heart on them, all the new names are nine for those. Now we're not done obviously, because there's cards that are not hearts. So keep going. Five if the card is a club. Okay. So make sure you guys understand you have to keep going until you've covered all the cards. So what else? Seven if uh, the card is spades. Uh, so seven if the card is a spade. And what's left? The diamonds. So just make up any number. Six if the card is a uh, club. I mean, diamonds, yeah. Right. Yeah. That takes care of everything because every card is one of those. So let's see here. So the jack of hearts. So, so here, outcome. And then value of X. I'm just going to write a couple of these. You don't have to write this on a quiz. This is just so I make sure we understand what's written here. Jack of hearts. The new name is nine. How about um, ace of diamonds? That's D for diamonds. What does that change to? Six. 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 Here, one more. What about the five of spades? What is that getting changed to? Seven. Seven. If it's a spade, we change it to seven. Yeah. And anyway, this is taking care of all the cards. You got to make sure that these groups that you mentioned here cover all the bases and no card is in more than one. So every card is either a heart, club, spade, or diamond, and there's no card that's both a heart and a club or something like this. So there's no overlap. So yeah, that works. All right, let's try another one. Now, when I say another one, I don't want to write the same thing and just change the numbers. That's fine, but that's like the same kind of example. So I want a different kind of example. So in other words, try to come up with another way of grouping the cards and then we could relabel the outcome. So someone try it. Um, all face cards are equal to four. Okay. So four, if the card is a face card. All right, I like it. And then uh, the numbered cards are um, 11. So 11, if the card is a number card. And five of it's an ace. Five of the card is an ace, yeah. Yeah, wonderful, that covers everything. Every card is either a face card, a number card, or an ace. Yeah, sounds good, I like it. Okay, questions on that one? Just to make sure we're clear on what this says. I'm calling this Y here, value of Y. Okay, so if you draw the um, nine of diamonds, what are we changing it to? Eleven. Yeah, we're changing that to number 11. Uh, what if it's um, the king of clubs, what are we changing it to? Four. Yeah, king is a face card, so it's got a face on it. So yeah, so face card, we're changing it to four, yeah. And every card, this is again, you don't write any of this thing, kind of thing on the quiz. This is just so we get comfortable understanding what this is trying to communicate here. All right, let's do more examples. Uh, somebody come up with a different example. Same experiment, we're drawing a card out of a deck. We gotta relabel the names with numbers. Let me call it Z. Here, I'll give you one. So understand that random variables is something you actually do all the time. I shouldn't say all the time, but you do it often, okay? So now, so for those of you who have played blackjack in your lives, um, maybe some of you haven't played that game, which is fine, but if you have played it, you've been doing this all the time. Like when you see a king of clubs in blackjack, you don't think king of clubs. What do you think when you see a king of clubs? Um, I'm sorry, say that again, I didn't hear you. Ten? Ten. Yeah, you think it's a ten. 
because the king of clubs is worth 10. So automatically when you see king of clubs, your brain transfers that information and thinks 10. So you're automatically relabeling it and think of it as a 10. So it's not a 10, it's a king of clubs. If it's a king of hearts, king of diamonds, jack of hearts, queen of spades, you always think 10. So you're automatically relabeling it with the 10. That's what a random variable does. It changes the name. Uh, when you see a two of hearts, a two of hearts is not a number because there's hearts. But when you see a two of hearts in blackjack, you don't you ignore the suit completely and you just think of it as a two. Okay, so this we have to relabel with a two. Okay, so the way you would do it, this, this is what I'm, I'm calling this one the blackjack random variable. This is when you're playing blackjack and you see a card, what do you think of? So you think of a 10 if the card is a face card. So any face card is worth 10. Uh, it's going to be the number on the card if the card is a number card. So in other words, nine of diamonds, we're going to think of it as the number that's on the card. So think of it as a nine. Okay. And then what have I left off? So we got face cards and numbers, so we're gonna write the aces. So just kind of like the last one, if the card is an ace. Now, in the game of blackjack, an ace is worth one or 11, but we can't have that in a random variable. We have to change the name to one of them. So you just pick one. So I'll just say like 11, if the card is an ace. Okay. Or you could just say one. That's the blackjack random variable. Okay, uh, any questions? Before we move on to the next one, let me just show you real quickly another example. So I didn't write this one down, but let's say the experiment is that you roll a pair of dice. So, you know, you guys have played things like Monopoly, things like this, where you roll a pair of dice. Um, but if you roll a pair of dice in the game of Monopoly, you don't really care if you got a three, four, or a five, two, you're not gonna care. What do you do when you see three, four in Monopoly? What do you do? You move seven spaces. It doesn't matter. And if this, if you roll the five, two instead, you still roll, you still move seven spaces. So when you see this or this, you don't really care about the different out there. They are different outcomes, but they're not different moves in the game of Monopoly. You just move seven spaces. So what did you do? You just, you add the numbers, right? So the random variable can be the sum of the numbers on the die, on the dice. So just some quick, ex um, so this is an example that I'm giving you so you can understand that you've done this your whole life. Okay, you always do this. You, you look at the outcome by four when you're rolling a pair of dice and you think to yourself, move nine spaces. Okay, three, two, you think move five spaces. So automatically, you, when you roll a three and a two, you go, oh, I gotta move five spaces. Then you forgot completely that you rolled a three, two. You just remembered five spaces. So again, you're seeing something, you're seeing an outcome and you're changing the name to something you care about. What do I care about in this example is how many spaces I need to move if I'm playing Monopoly. Okay, uh, let's do uh, the last couple of experiments real quick here. Here it says, um, you're gonna draw two cards from a deck of cards, one at a time with replacement. This one says draw one at a time without replacement. So let's make sure you think of the outcome. So here's an outcome, something like king of hearts, king of diamonds. That's an outcome of drawing two cards. Another one is like a king of hearts, king of hearts. If you're drawing with replacement, you can get king of hearts twice. Uh, here's another outcome, ace of spades, four of diamonds. I want you to notice what I'm doing. I'm first writing down some outcomes so I can get comfortable with what my experiment is. So that's the very first thing you gotta do. Read the experiment carefully, get comfortable with what it is know what the outcomes look like, and then go, okay, this is not a number, this is not a number, this is not a number. I gotta come up with a way, a verbal description of how to change this and this and this and everything like this to a number. Okay. So someone give me an example, or make an attempt at a, at a, a definition of a random variable on this, on this experiment. So again, the outcomes are like pairs of cards instead of one. Three if card. the cards are the same. Say it again. Three if the cards are the same. Okay, when you say if they're the same, do you mean they're exactly the same? Like jack, yeah. of, heart, jack of hearts? Yeah. Or do you mean if one's a jack and the other's a jack, then it's three? 
No, like, I don't care. We just have to make two it clear. and same symbol oh. or number. Okay, so then three if the car if the if the two cards are exactly the same. I'll just put the word exactly just to be a little extra clear. So it means they have the same suit and the same rank. Okay, cool. Okay, what else? That's not everything, right? There are outcomes where they're not exactly the same. So what else? Um, two if they're not. Okay. Um, so now sometimes you'll find yourself when you're writing a random variable, you'll find yourself writing a bunch of lines. Oh, here in this situation, it's a two. In this situation, it's a seven. In this situation, it's a nine. And, and it takes a long time. You're like, oh my God, this is going to take forever. Then you can use this trick. This trick, you're probably going to love it. It's kind of cheating a little bit. I call it the otherwise trick. Um, basically, it's when you're like over it and you don't want to think about any more groups, you can write two otherwise. You don't have to write the number two, but you write otherwise. So it's like, in this situation, we're changing all those cards to three and everything else changes to two. Okay, so that'll kind of, but the good thing about the otherwise trick is that it'll get you out of a jam when your list kind of goes long and you're like, oh, just otherwise, you know, and then put like a number like seven or something. Okay, so that one works. Now, technically, this doesn't work for part D. So I'm going to write this for part C only. Because the cards can't be exactly the same if you're drawing without replacement, which is what part D says. Okay, let's get one more example. Okay, one last one. Let's do something like, um, you could look at the suits. So one if, or let's do this, one if both cards are red, two if both are black, Um, and then you could do like, if the first card is red and the second card is black, or, or if the third, if the first card is black and the second card is red, or you can combine those into one and say like, you know, five, if the cards are different color, meaning one is red and the other is black. Okay. So you just, you group them together, but you have to make sure that these groups cover every pair of cards because we're talking about pairs of cards here, okay? And no overlap. And there can't be any overlap because they can't both be red and both be black. They can't both be red and have different colors, you know, that kind of thing. All right, so that's what a random variable is. Okay, so let me just recap this part of the lecture and then we'll go to the next part. So every experiment, no matter how simple or complicated, can be just thought of as drawing one time out of a bag you just put the outcomes of your experiment in the bag. And then the next thing is, we can even make the outcomes numbers. And the way you make the outcomes numbers is you relabel the names, you change the names to numbers. Okay, and that's what a random variable is. A random variable is a way of taking all the outcomes of the experiment and changing all the names to numbers. All right, let's move on. So now we're gonna learn some things about the random variables. Okay, so probably the distribution of random variables. Every random variable has a probability distribution. A probability distribution basically tells you the probability of drawing the number out of the bag. So remember, so at this point, when you think of random variable, you should think of bag width numbers. So let's, here's a bag width numbers. Okay, and I'm gonna call the bag X, okay? Um, so there's my bag of numbers. This bag may have come from somewhere else, but we have bag of numbers. A probability distribution is gonna be a table for us today, and it's gonna be a two column table. So the point is after the first part of the lecture, once you understood the first part of the lecture, every probability problem is now drawing once out of a bag of numbers. So we got a bag of numbers. When I say random variable think, we're drawing once out of this bag of numbers. And the probability distribution tells me two things. It's gonna be a two column table. The left column, you're gonna put a little X here. Then over here, you're going to write down all the different things that can be drawn out of the bag. So in this picture, you would put one, two, three, four. Don't, even if it's there more than once, do not list it more than once. You have to list all the different things that could be drawn out of the bag. It goes on the left there. Okay, so we see ones, twos, threes, and fours can come out of this bag. Okay, 
And then the right side of the table, <clears throat> if you're like, but wait, there's a lot of twos, not so many threes. How do I communicate that? You're gonna communicate that on the right side of the table. And the notation is probability capital X equals little x. We'll talk more about this notation in a minute. And these numbers are gonna be the probability of drawing that number out of the bag. The probability of drawing the number one out of the bag, well, you look at the bag, there's two ones out of how many things total? Eight. Remember, num bottom number is always how many things are in the bag total, so eight. And top is how many ones you have, two out of eight. And you would do this for every number that can be pulled out of the bag. So the probability of drawing number two, three out of eight, because there's three twos uh, out of eight total. Probably drawing number three, one out of eight. Probably drawing number four, two out of eight. That's a probability distribution. A probability distribution for a random variable is a table. The left side tells you what numbers are in the bag, and the right side says what's the probability of getting those numbers. So what this says is there's a two out of eight probability of drawing the number one. There's a one out of eight probability of drawing the number three and so on. Every random variable has a probability distribution. It's gonna be, it tells you the probability, let's, let's see what it says. The probability distribution tells you the probability for each value of the random variable. It's gonna be a table or a histogram, but you're, I'm gonna always gonna have you make a table, but I think I might draw one or two histograms today. We'll see. Now to calculate the probability distribution for a more complicated problem, you gotta go back to the sample space. So the problem I just gave you right now that I just erased, I drew the bag of numbers, but sometimes you're not gonna to wanna to draw the bag of numbers, in which case you wanna go back to the sample space. So think of it as um, the sample space is like the old bag before we change the names, and then your random variable is like the new bag after we change the names. So you know if it's, um, let's say there's heads and tails and we change the name to three and five, I want, when I, I want to find the probability distribution of this, but if you're not, if you're having tr trouble in a more complicated problem and wanting to know how many threes are here, I know you could see that there's one three and there's one five, but if I don't draw this bag for you, or if it's a more complicated problem, you want to know how many threes are there, you might have to go back over here and go, which of those got changed to the number three? Which of those got changed to the number five? So the way I'm going to say that is to calculate the probabilities, you want to go back to the sample space go back to the original outcomes before we change the names. Okay, uh, I'll say a couple more things here and then we'll do some examples. There's two requirements for a probability distribution for a discrete random variable. Remember, probability distribution is a table. There's two requirements on it. Remember, it's gonna be, um, there's gonna be a little x on the left. There's gonna be a probability capital X equals little x on the right. There's no requirements for this part of the table because these are the name, the new names of the outcomes. The new names are allowed to be anything. So there's no conditions on these, these can be anything. But these numbers over here are probabilities. So there are some requirements because probabilities can't just be anything. So the two requirements are, the first one is all the numbers here, okay, so on this side, this part of the table, since they're probabilities, they all have to be between zero and one because we know probabilities are always between zero and one. And the second thing is if you add all the numbers on this side, so if you add all these up, you have to get one. You have to get 100% because, in other words, th these outcomes have to cover all the bases. So there's 100% chance you get one of those numbers out of the bag. So again, there's two requirements on this side of the table. Okay, first one is uh, all the probabilities between zero and one, this is how we write it, probability capital X equals little x. Between zero and one, this is how you write that. When you put a zero here, a one here, and you put less than or equal twos, that means this thing is between them. So that just says all the probabilities on the right side of the table are between zero and one. And the second requirement is if you add them, this symbol, we've seen it before, it means add. If you add all the probabilities on the right side of the table, you get one. Okay, so just a couple of requirements on the right side of the table. All right, so now let's do a couple of examples here. Uh, okay, example two, let me make it smaller. Okay, we're gonna roll a pair of dice. The random variable is the total of the numbers on the dice. Part A says find the probability distribution and uh, verify that it satisfies the requirements. So now the reason why this is harder is because now I'm giving you the experiment and I'm giving you the random variable. I'm not saying you make up your own, I'm making it up. And you have to pay attention to what it says and make sure you understand what it says and then we can go and do this problem. So let's be very clear on what the experiment is. So read that carefully in every one of these problems, make sure you're completely clear what the experiment is. And just to help you out, maybe write a couple of outcomes real quick. I'm gonna write down a couple of outcomes you don't have to do this on a quiz, but you should be doing this in your mind to make sure you understand what the experiment is. So somebody tell me an outcome when you roll a pair of dice. The experiment is for rolling a pair of dice. Somebody give me an outcome.
Anyone? Four. No, that's not an outcome. We're rolling a pair of dice. Eight. That's not an outcome. Give me an outcome when you roll a pair of dice. It would be like three. Two and two. four. Oh. Yeah, I heard two, four. The other one I couldn't quite hear what was the other one. Three, two. Three, two. Give me one more outcome. Someone. One, six. One, six. And let me give you another one. Four, four. There's lots of them. And then, okay, so, so see what I'm saying? All you people who said four, someone said four, someone said eight, you're not completely getting it yet, but you're almost there, okay? What you're giving me is not an outcome. You're giving me a value of the variable. So there's the experiment. It's got outcomes. And then we're changing the names. So all these things are having their names changed. And the new name is going to be called X. So the value, we call it the value of X. So now, if this is the outcome, when you roll a pair of dice, if you get this, let's read what X says now. X is the total. So you got to read those very carefully, okay? Make sure. So if this doesn't say total, you might have to do something totally different. But here it says X is the total. So what is the name of this outcome getting changed to? So if the outcome is 2, 4, what's the value of X? Anyone? Six. Six, right. If the outcome is three, two, if you're rolling a pair of dice and you, the outcome is three, two, what's the value of X? Five. Five. Five, yeah. Again, it's saying the variable that we're making up, it's the total of the numbers. So you just add the numbers. If the outcome is one, six, what's the value of X? Seven. Seven. If we're rolling a four, four, the value of X is eight. And anyway, there's lots of them. So again, I don't need to see any of this, but you should be doing this at least in your mind to make sure you're completely clear. So be completely clear what the experiment is and what outcomes look like. Then read the variable carefully and make sure you understand how we're changing the names to the new names, and then we can go do the problems. Everybody clear on this much? I can't stress it enough. Be super clear on every part of it so you got to read the question, obviously, really carefully, make sure you're completely clear, and then, then it should be okay. Now let's go ahead and do part A. Part A says find the probability distribution for X. All right, so here, part A. So we're going to make a table, two-column table. Okay, a little more, let me draw a little more, but again, you wouldn't do this on a, on a quiz or an exam or anything. But the idea is the sample space, the outcomes. So we got one, 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 two, one, three, one, four, one, five, one, six, two, one, two, two. I'm not gonna label them all until you get to six, five, six, six. Those are all the outcomes when you roll a pair of dice. And we're changing the names to whatever the total is. So this is getting its name changed to two. This is getting its name changed to three. This is changing to four, five, six, seven. In the next row, that's a three, that's a four, and on and on. In the very last one, we got an 11 and a 12. Right, the total of those is 11, total of those is 12. So we have two bags. This is the old bag, and this is the new bag. This is the one we care about, but if we ever need to know some information about it and we don't know, we can go back to this bag to figure it out. All right, so the random variable is the total of the numbers on the die. So you read that. All the different possible values of your variable go here. So you have to ask yourself, if you roll a pair of dice, what are all the different totals you can get? Someone tell me what totals you can get. What's the smallest total you can get? Two. Two. What's the next smallest total? Three. Three. And all the different totals. Don't write the same total more than once. Even though in this bag, the three is there more than once, don't write it more than once. Write it once only. Once for all of them. Then there's four, you can get a total of four, you can get a total of five, and all the different totals you can get, you list them all. It's basically you listing all the numbers in this bag, but don't list the same number more than once. 
So let's see, let's keep going. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. When do I stop? At 12. You stop at 12, that's right. Because 12 is the biggest total you can get. That's when you roll six, six, right? That's the only one. Okay, so we have that. Now we gotta find the probabilities of each of these. Okay, so to find the probability, you, you have to go back to the sample space. So if I say, what's the probability of rolling a two? You might say, this is wrong, okay? So don't do this. Here, let me get this table going first. You might say the probability of rolling a two, one out of 11 this is totally wrong. Let's make sure you understand what I did so you don't do this. You might say, okay, I see one, two, and I see 11 numbers total. That's totally wrong. This is the deal. You have, it's this bag here, okay? How many twos are in the bag and how many numbers are in their total? There's only one two in the bag, but how many numbers are in their total? The answer is 36. If you're unclear, you go back to the sample space and go, well, when you roll a pair of dice, how many outcomes are there? There's 36. Okay, so you don't count the different numbers here. You have to count all the numbers, even if they repeat more than once, you gotta count them more than once. So you go back to the sample space and go, well, there's 36 things in the sample space. So the, all the denominators for these numbers are all gonna be 36. The reason the top is one, there's only one two in the bag. And if you're like, well, how do you know there's only one two in the bag? Well, where did the two come from? It came from one one. Don't forget what you're doing. How can you get a total of two? The only way you can get a total of two is if you roll a one and a one. There's no other way to get a total of two. Okay, now I'm gonna erase these bags, okay? These bags were just so you get the idea because a lot of times, it's unfortunate, but a lot of times the books don't show you this kind of picture. But part of the reason is they want you to do it without the picture, but I need you to think about the picture because when I'm doing the calculation, I'm always thinking about that picture that I just erased. Okay, so okay. And then this note, the notation, by the way, for this is probability capital X equals one. Let's take a look real quick. So there's the notation there, right? The little x stands for, oh, sorry, I wrote it wrong, it's two. The little x stands for this number over here, okay? So there's the answer, the notation for that answer is this, and I wanna make sure you understand what it says. There's an equal sign in the parentheses, which might get a little, might feel a little weird, but it's not weird. It's like this. This is how you would read this. If you roll a pair of dice, the probability that the total, remember x is the total, is two. Find the probability the total is two. When rolling a pair of dice, what's the probability the total is two? So capital X, read it as the total, because that's what it is, it's the total, is two. Okay, we're gonna do a couple more. Let's do this one here. Probability, so if you roll a pair of dice, what's the probability the total is four? Okay, first of all, what is the denominator? Thirty-six. Thirty-six. It's gonna be thirty-six for all of them. Again, if you get confused, you go back to the sample space. You go back to the experiment, the rolling a pair of dice experiment, and go. How many outcomes are there when you roll a pair of dice? There's thirty-six outcomes, so you put thirty-six on the bottom. Now to get the top, you have to go. How many of those got their name changed to four? Or another way to say it is, how many of those have a total? Because the name we're changing the name to the total of four. Here's one way to get a total of four. Are there any other ways? Three, two, one. Two. Three, one, and two, two. And that's it. So there's three ways to get a total of four. So that probably is three out of 36. Okay, so you see, so that's how that goes. You gotta go back to the sample space and go, how can you get a total of four? How can you get this to be four? And here are the outcomes that give you a total of four. Here, let's do another one. Let's do probability, uh, that the total is seven. Okay, so again, what is uh, the denominator? Thirty-six. Thirty-six. Okay, to get the top, you have to ask yourself, how can I get a total of seven? I'm wondering in the new bag, how many sevens are in there? So that's what I wanna know, how many are in there? But in this case, you're gonna go back to the old bag and go, well, here's a way to get a total of seven. Here's another way to get a total of seven. You have to kind of figure out all the ways to get a total of seven. So just, you kind of just 
think about that for a second and see. So we can a one and a six gives me a total of seven. A two five gives me a total of seven. Any other ones? Three four. Uh huh. Any other ones? Six one. Yeah. Five two. Uh huh. Four three. Yep. And that's it. How many ways is that? Six. 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 So six out of 36 is that probability. All right, let's do one last one. Let's do probability X equals nine. So again, this, again, if you're gonna read this, you're gonna say if you roll a pair of dice, what's the probability that the total is nine? Okay, total is nine. Because X stands for the total when you roll a pair of dice. Okay, so again, bottom number is gonna be 36. The top number, we're going to count all the ways to get a total of nine. This is not an outcome, okay? There's no eight on the die, so there's no way to get that as a total of nine. The three, oh, that's wrong. Yeah, that's right, sorry. Uh, that one has a total of nine. Any other ones? Four, five, wait. Uh-huh, four, five, yeah. What else? Six, three. Okay, six, five, four. Six, five, four. Now, just so you guys know, when I list them, what I like to do is that, like, for this, for the previous one, I started with a one and I said, is there anything that goes here? And then I increased it from a one to a two, then to a three, and then to a four to make sure I got them all. So that's why I'm writing it in this order. It doesn't matter what order you write them in, but you got to make sure you get them all. So it's kind of nice to do it in kind of a, an orderly way so you make sure you get them all. So are there any ways to get a total of nine where the starting number is a one? No. Is there any way where the starting number is a two? No, because there's no seven. Starting number three? Yes. Starting number four, starting number five, starting number six kind of thing. And that kind of gives me all of them. So there's four ways of getting a total of nine. So that probability is four out of nine. All right, now you're supposed to calculate them all. I'm not gonna calculate them all as long as you've got, if, as long as you understood those four, I'll just write down the rest of the answers and you can calculate them after class and make sure that you understand how to do them. Is everybody with me on this much? Yeah. All right, so we go ahead and write down the rest of the answers. Again, I'm not, all the answers I'm gonna write now in red, I didn't show you how to find the answers, I mean, Sorry, I didn't calculate them for you. I did show you how to find it. Turns out there's a pattern, uh, not all the time, but for this problem there's a pattern. One out of six, two out of six, three, then it goes up to four out of 36, then it's five out of 36, then it's six out of 36. So kind of the number on top keeps going up, but then after it gets to six out of 36, it starts going back down. So it's five out of 36, four out of 36, three out of 36, two out of 36, and one out of 36. Okay, that's how that one goes. Uh, I'm, so we did the table. I'm not going to really ever have you draw the histogram, but I'm going to draw it once just so you see. Um, but that's how you do the table, which is very important. Is there any questions on the table? Okay, again, all the red numbers, I didn't calculate them for you right now. I just gave you the answers, but make sure you, so calculate them at home and make sure you get the right answers there. Oops, whoa, whoa, whoa. All right, um, now let's go ahead and draw the histogram. So when you draw a histogram of this kind of thing, what you would do is you'd put a number line here. On the bottom, you would put the possible values of x, meaning these numbers here go on the bottom. The numbers in the left column go on the bottom. So I'm gonna put a two, three, four, five, I'm gonna keep going until I have the number 12 there. I'm gonna draw another number line this way and we'll put the probabilities on this number line, meaning these numbers are gonna go on the, that number line there. So we have a one out of 36, a two out of 36, three, four, five, and six. The probabilities don't get higher than that. All the histogram is is really a picture 
of the table that I just made. Okay, and then what you're gonna do is above each number on the bottom, you're gonna draw a rectangle. And the height of the rectangle is gonna be whatever the probability is. So for the number two, the probability is one out of 36. So above the number two, I'm gonna draw a rectangle or like a bar graph, it's like a bar graph. Histogram is the same thing as a bar graph, except histograms, they call it a histogram if there's numbers down here. If it isn't numbers down there, they call it a bar graph. You just draw a rectangle above each number. How high do you go? Whatever the probability is. So what I do is I go from a little bit on the left of two and I go up to one out of 36, a little bit on the right of two, go up to one out of 36, and I draw a rectangle like that. Okay, so that it's, that it's height, I'll shade it. You don't have to shade it. Height is one out of 36 there. I'll put this little dot, these dots to just indicate that I meant the height to be one out of 36. Then above the number three, I'm gonna draw a rectangle. How high? Two out of 36. So from this line here, we're gonna go up to two out of 36. And then on this side of three, I'm doing it so that the rectangle has the number three right in the middle of it, on the bottom, but in the middle. That height is intended to be two out of 36. And you just keep going for the next one, for above the number four, I'm gonna draw a rectangle with height three out of 36. These dotted lines you don't need to draw. I'm drawing them so that it's clear to you that what height I intended to draw the rectangle at. Above the five, I'm gonna draw a rectangle height four out of 36. Okay, above the number six, height five out of 36. going above the number seven height is six out of 36 and after that it goes back down right above eight we go five out of 36 so this same height over here and again it's just a picture of the table next one the height should be four out of 36 and then next one should be three out of 36 And then the next one should be two out of 36. And the next one should be one out of 36. Okay, so anyway, so that's, that's a histogram. That's a picture of the table is what it is. So again, bottom numbers are the left column of the table. The side numbers over here, right column of the table. And from a picture, you know, you can, uh, you can answer questions. Like if I say, when you roll a pair of dice, which total has the highest chance of coming up? What's the highest, what's the high, total that has the highest chance of coming up? Can you tell me? Seven. Yeah, because it's got the highest rectangle. It's got the highest chance. So when you roll a pair of dice, seven is the number that comes up the most. When you roll a pair of dice, what's the number that comes up the least? Or what's the total that comes up the least? 12 and 2. Right. 2 and 12 both have the shortest rectangles. You can also see that from the table, okay? But it's a picture of the table. All right, so that's how you draw the histogram. And now I'm really done with part A. Any questions on part A? Okay, let's go to part B. Part B says, verify your answer to part A satisfies the two requirements of a probability distribution. What are the two requirements? First one is, both requirements are on these probabilities. I'm not really gonna write anything down. We'll just look at them and make sure that they satisfy the requirements. Because you get online homework problems where they just give you the table and they say, do they satisfy the requirements? So what are you supposed to do? You first have to make sure that all the probabilities, all the numbers that are, oops, that are on this side of the table, you have to make sure they're all between zero and one. Okay, so they all gotta be between zero and one and they are because, okay, here's a number line. Here's zero and one. Well, I want all the probabilities to be between here and here. If they're not there, then they would either be here or they would be here. If they're here, then they'd be negative. But you look at the answers, none of these are negative, so that's good, so they're not here. And these numbers here are bigger than one. And if you look at these fractions, a fraction can only be bigger than one if the top number is bigger than the bottom. But if you look at them all, the bottom is 36 and all the top numbers are less than 36. So none of them are here. Therefore, they're all here. 
Okay, so again, as long as none of them are negative, and as long as the top number is smaller than the bottom number, then all the numbers are between zero and one. So that's the first part. And the second part you have to check is that if you add them up, if you add all these numbers, you have to get exactly one. Let's go ahead and add them real quick. If you do one out of 36 plus two out of 36, the denominators are the same, that's the denominator of the answer, and you just add the top. So you get three out of 36 when you add those. Then add to this, you get six out of 36, then add 10 out of 36, 15, 21, 26, 30, 33, 35, 36 out of 36 when you add them. But that's one. So the sum is one, so that works. So again, I didn't really write much down. You just do that in your head, okay? So just make sure all these are between zero and one, the right numbers, the numbers on the right side of the table, and make sure that if you add them all, you get exactly one, which we did, so it satisfies the requirements. All right, any questions on example two? All right, let's move on, another example. This is part of an old quiz question. Um, so you can get an idea of the level of difficulty of the quiz question that you'll get next class. But again, this, is, this would only be like half of that question. Let's see what it says here, experiment. Draw a single card from a deck of cards. So that's what we're doing. We're drawing a single card from a deck of cards, but then we're making a bet. It says, suppose you make a bet with your friend. You're betting on what card you get, and you're gonna win $10 if you draw the ace of spades. You're gonna win $5 if you draw any other ace. You're gonna win $2 if you draw any other spade. And you're gonna lose a dollar if you draw anything else. And then the variable is the amount of money you win. So you gotta read it really carefully, okay? First, make sure what we're doing, you know what we're doing. I mean, in other words, make sure you know what the experiment is. We're drawing one card out of a deck of cards. So you want to think, okay, what is the thing we're doing? We're drawing a card out of a deck of cards. What do the outcomes look like? And then you want to read the variable carefully. It says it's the amount of money you win. So we're changing the outcome to how much money we win. Old name, new name, right? The new name is just how much money we win. And after you're completely clear on this situation, then you go do these parts. All right, so let me uh, make it smaller. So again, you wouldn't have to do this on a quiz or an exam. Just to make sure we get it, let me uh, practice this a little bit. Value of x. Some, give, somebody give me an outcome of the experiments. An ace of spades. Ace of spades, yeah. We're, remember, the experiment is we're drawing a single card of a deck of cards. So just give me a single card, like ace of spades. Uh, okay, and if you were to draw the ace of spades, what's the value of x? Let's read x again. x is how much money you win. How much money are you going to win if you draw the ace of spades? It's communicated up there. What's the answer? $10. $10. So you see we're changing the name. The ace is, it's like we're taking the ace of spades card and erasing it and writing $10 on there. So we're changing the name. The new name is $10. Okay, so we changed the name, but the name we change it to is what I care about, and I care about how much money I win. So that's what it says here. In this problem, X is the amount of money we win. That's what we care about. So I don't really care that it was the ace of spades. I care that I won $10. All right, somebody give me another outcome. Five of spades. Okay, five of spades. All right, and then what's the value of X for that outcome? $2. Right, yeah. What it says up here is you win $10 if you draw the ace of spades. If you draw any other ace, you're gonna win five. If you draw any other spade, when it says other spade besides the ace of spades, so any other spade, you win $2. So five of spades gives you $2, also three of spades, you'd also win $2. Okay, let me give you another one. Let's say you get the ace of hearts. How much would you, what's the value of X for that one? Five. Five dollars. Yeah. And one last one, three of clubs. How much are you gonna win for that? One dollar. You're actually gonna lose. So because you're gonna lose, you put a negative in the front, okay? If X is the amount of money you win and it says you're gonna lose, Put a negative. Okay, so we got that. Okay, so that's just so we can get an idea of what's happening here. Let me erase this and draw some pictures. So again, you don't need to, you do not need to draw these pictures either. But I want you to get what we're doing before we do it. So the sample space 
is a bag of outcomes. Okay, so ace, um, ace of spades, two of spades, three of spades, four of spades, so on. Ace of clubs, two of clubs, three of clubs, so on. Ace of hearts, two of hearts, three of hearts, and so on. Ace of diamonds, two. So these are all the cards in the deck of cards, and we're changing all the names by this rule here. We're changing it to how much money we win, and we have some rule for how much money we win. So we know the ace of spades changes to ten dollars, and then the two, the rest of the spades are changing to two dollars. There's lots of twos in here. Ace of clubs, we're going to win five dollars, and then for all the rest of these clubs, we're going to lose a dollar. Dollar. Um, Ace of hearts, we're going to win five dollars. The rest of the time, we're going to lose a dollar. Uh, and then last one here, again, we're going to win five dollars or we're going to lose. So we have this new bag of numbers now. This is what we're really caring about. But how many things are in the new bag? The same as the amount of things in the old bag. The old bag has 52 cards in there. The new bag also has 52 things in there. Just the new bag has some of them repeating more than once. So there isn't 52 different things in the new bag, but there is 52 different things in the old bag. Okay. Um, all right, so now, <clears throat> part A says find the probability distribution. So little x, and then probability, capital X, equals little x. Okay, so again, make sure you're completely clear what the experiment is. Make sure you're completely clear what x is. X is the amount of money you win. All the different amounts of money you can win go here. So what goes there on the left side of the table? Okay, if you're unclear, you read this carefully. It says X is the amount of money you win when playing this game once. X is the amount of money you win. All the different amounts of money you can win go here. Another way to say it is all the different numbers you see in this bag go here. Someone tell me what goes there. So $10. Make sure you put the units, okay, if it has units. So $10. What else? Uh, $5. $5, yeah. Uh, $2. Uh-huh. And then minus $1. And minus $1, yeah, exactly. Don't list anything more than once. So even though you see the two in this bag more than once, only list it once. We'll communicate the fact that it's there. They could happen multiple ways over here. Okay, so then we have to find the probabilities of these things. So now I'm going to erase the bags. But the idea is in this bag, I want to find the probability of 10. So I have to, the top number would be how many 10s I have in this bag. The bottom would be how many numbers I have total in the bag. But anyway, let me erase these bags now because the point is you should be trying to do it without the bag, without looking at the bag. But just the bag is just, you know, so you get what we're doing. So, okay, what's the bottom number going to be? 52. 52, that's right. If you ever get confused, you go back to the sample space. We're drawing a card out of a deck of cards. There's 52 cards total in a deck of cards. So bottom number is going to be 52 for all of them. I don't want you to look at it and go, oh, there's four things, so four. No. Go back to the sample space of drawing a card out of a deck of cards. There's 52 different things. Okay, now, how many of those cards will produce a win of $10? How many of those cards? Only one. Only one. So that the probability here is one out of 52. The notation is probability capital X equals $10. So it's basically I'm writing this down, but the little x I'm changing to the number that's here, $10. And you would read this like this. If you draw a single card from a deck of cards, what's the probability that the amount of money you win, because x is the amount of money you win, is $10. If you draw a card from a deck of cards, what's probably the amount of money you win is $10. And yeah, only the ace of spades will produce a win of $10. So there's one outcome out of 52 where you can win $10. Okay, the notation for this is probability that the amount of money you win is $5. Uh, now you have to figure out all the ways you can win $5. You can win $5 if you draw any ace besides the ace of spades. So ace of clubs, ace of hearts, ace of diamonds. Any of those, you'll win $5. So what number goes on top? Three. Three. There's three, three cards that will give you a win of $5. Questions? 
Okay, next one, probably you win $2. Okay, so how can you win $2? You'll win $2 if you draw any other spade besides the ace of spades. I'm not gonna list them all, but think about it for a second. There's 13 spades total, right? But you're not gonna win, there's not 13 ways to win because uh, if you draw the ace of spades, you're gonna win $10, you're not gonna win $2. So basically how many other spades are there? Twelve. Okay, so twelve. You're right. And then for the last one, uh, a couple of ways you can figure it out. You can list all the other cards, which would kind of suck. Or you can go like this. You can go, well, how many cards have we counted so far? One, three, twelve. We counted sixteen cards so far. You can add the one, three, and twelve and get sixteen. So all the rest of the cards must be ways where you can lose a dollar. So you could do like 52 minus 16 kind of thing. And that would give you 36. Just imagine you have a deck of cards. Throw out the ace of spades, throw out the other aces, throw out the other spades, and count how many you have left. And you'll have, you had 52, you threw away 16 of them, you have 36 left. The notation for this is probably capital X equals negative $1. Okay, let's go to make the histogram for this. All the histogram is is a picture of the table. And again, I'm usually not going to ask you on a quiz to do that, but let me just do one real quick here. So when you make the histogram, what you do is you draw a number line like that, you draw another number line like this, like an X and Y axis kind of thing. The numbers on the left side of the table go on the bottom. So I have to put 10, 5, 2, and negative 1 on the bottom. I'll put negative 1 over here because it's negative. Usually when you draw a Y axis, that's where zero is. So if you have a negative number, you draw it on the left of it. So negative $1 goes on the left, $2 goes on the right, $5 goes on the right, and then $10, because those are all positive numbers. All the values of your variable, all the numbers on the left column of the table go on the bottom there. All the probabilities go on, the, on this number line that's going upward. So um, this is gonna be one out of 36. Oh, sorry, what am I doing? One out of 52. So all these numbers I'm going to put on the y-axis, so to speak. So that's 1 out of 52. Then there's a 3 out of 52. And there's a 12 out of 52. You don't have to get it perfect, but let me just be annoying and say, if that's 12 out of 52, then 36 out of 52 would be way up here. Okay, so like that. So you put, so you put those four probabilities. And then all you do is you, drew, you draw a bar or a rectangle above each of the numbers that are on the axis down there and the height of it is gonna be the probability. Let's start with the number 10. So 10, the probability is one out of 52. So where the 10 is, I'm gonna draw a rectangle. I'm just gonna go a little bit before it, a little bit after it. And how high am I gonna go? The one out of 52 height, this high. Let's draw a rectangle like that. I like the, the number to be in the middle of the rectangle and the height of it to be whatever the probability is. Let's go to the next one. For $5, I'm gonna draw a rectangle above the number five. How high am I gonna to go? To the number three out of 52. So I start usually a little before it, a little bit after it, and I go to the height of three out of 52. I go that high. And you just draw a rectangle. You don't even have to shade it, but I'm shading it for fun. Uh, let's go to the next one, $2. I'm gonna draw a rectangle above that. How high? 12 out of 52. So just I start a little before it, a little after it, and I go up to a height of 12 out of 52. Okay, and then one more. I'm gonna draw a rectangle above the number negative one. How high? 36 out of 52. So I'm gonna go a little before, a little bit after. I'm gonna go up all the way to 36 out of 52. Sorry if these lines don't look straight. Jeez, they're horrible. Try again. That was really bad. Well, the y-axis is kind of bad. Okay. Let's go to that height, 36 out of 52, and again, you can shade it if you want. That's a histogram. It's just a picture of the table. That's all it is. But the good thing about having a picture is you can answer questions like, what's the most common thing that'll happen? Well, the higher the rectangle, the higher chance that thing has of happening. So losing a dollar has the highest chance of happening. What has the smallest chance of happening, the shortest rectangle is, uh, you know, 
the higher the height is, the, again, the, the lower the height is, the lower the probability is. So the probability of winning $10 is very low. Of course, you can see that from the table as well. It's just a picture of the table. Right, that's how you make a histogram. Any questions on that much? Okay. Um, then it says verify this uh, satisfies the requirements for a probability distribution. Again, there's no requirements on the left column Left column of the table. The left column can be any numbers at all, so you don't even need to look at those. But you look at the right column, and two things have to happen. First of all, all the numbers have to be between 0 and 1, and if you add them all, it has to be exactly 1. Again, we can see all the numbers are between 0 and 1 because the, none of the numbers are negative, and all the tops are smaller than the bottoms. That means none of them are bigger than 1, so they're all between 0 and 1. And then you can add them up and see that we get exactly one. One out of 52 plus three out of 52, that's four out of 52. Plus this is 16 out of 52 plus 36 is uh, 52 out of 52, which is one. So it does satisfy the requirements. Again, that's very important uh, that you do that on the quiz to double check that you got the table right. All right, example three is done. Any questions? Okay, I got one quick question for you then. If someone offers you this bet, all right, let's bet on uh, drawing out of a deck of cards. I offer this to you. Should you make this bet? Is it a good game for you to play or not? What do you think? No. No? Why not? Because my chances of losing are higher than winning. Okay, chances of losing are higher than winning. Okay. You are correct. The chances of losing are higher than winning. But this is the next thing we're going to do. We're going to analyze games like this and see if it's a good game or a bad game. It actually turns out this is a very good game for you to play. And if anyone ever offers this game to you, you should play it and you should play it often. And if you're not willing, then call me up. I will play it for you and I'll play it often. Let me explain um, why. Because it's not just the probability that you care about. Like, let me, let me change it. Let's say, I know that there's such a big chance of losing such a small chance of winning. But let's just say that if you draw the ace of spades, instead of winning $10, you win $1 million. Would you play now? You would, right? Yes. Because you'd lose a bunch of times. You'd lose so many times, but each time you're just losing a dollar. But then eventually you're going to hit the ace of spades. You play it long enough and you're going to win a million dollars. And that's more than going to cover whatever you lost along the way. So what I'm trying to tell you is when you're trying to figure out if a game is a good game or a bad game to play, you don't just look at the probabilities of winning and losing. You look at when you win and lose, how much do you win and how much do you lose? Those numbers are important too. And that's going to take us to the next thing. Expected value, variance, and standard deviation of a random variable. So remember, random variable, you can think of it as a bag with numbers in them. And basically what I want to know is the average, the mean of all of them, the standard deviation, which we call sigma, and the variance, which is sigma squared, of all the numbers in, in your random variable bag, okay? And the mean is called, all, is called when, when we're dealing with random variable, we call the mean the expected value, okay? So it's kind of like stuff we've learned how to do, uh, you know, second day of class when we learn standard deviation, things like this. But there's a different way to do it when you have a random variable. So here. There's, so when I say random variable, think bag of numbers. I'm not showing you what's in there right now, but I'm giving you the probability distribution. When I give you probability distribution, what am I telling you? This is telling you the different numbers in the bag. So I know there's twos, threes, fives, and eights in this bag. I don't know how many of each, but there's some twos, some threes, some fives, and some eights. And the probability distribution, I mean, the probability part is telling me the probability of drawing that number out of the bag. If I was to put my hand in and draw once, I have a 20% probability of drawing the number two, a 10% probability of drawing the number three, 40% probability of drawing the number five, and a 30% prob probability of drawing the number eight. So the probabilities kind of let me, give me an idea of how many, don't look there, of how many numbers are in the bag. So this tells me there's twice as many twos as there are threes. There's less threes. Double probability of getting a two, so there's twice as many twos. What I want to do is I want to calculate the average standard deviation and variance of all these numbers without seeing all the numbers in the bag just by using this table. So what I'm going to do for the next minute is I'm going to kind of derive a formula for you. It's going to get a little weird, but in the end, it'll be not a big deal. 
So let me say it again. We have a random variable, which is a bag of numbers. I want to find the average. We're gonna, we'll worry on about expected value only right now. So just the average. I want to know the average of all the numbers without being able to see them all. As long as I know the table, that's all I need to figure out the average of all the numbers in the bag. But I'm going to cheat. I'm going to show you the numbers in the bag for the minute. There's the numbers in the bag. Now we know how to find the average of those numbers. First of all, let me back up. Do you guys agree that this probability distribution is correct? Meaning there's only twos, threes, fives, and eights in the bag, right? You agree with that? Only twos, threes, fives, and eights, yes? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And then there's 10 numbers total if you count them. The problem of getting the number two is two out of 10. There's two twos, 10 total. There's only one three, 10 total. So probably getting a three is one out of 10. Probably getting a five is four out of 10. There's four fives, 10 total. Anyway, so the probability distribution is matching this picture. Now to find the average, you're supposed to add them up and divide by how many you have. I'm gonna do that, but I'm gonna do it in a weird way. So I'm supposed to do two plus two plus three plus five plus five, whatever, and then divide by 10. I'm gonna do that, but I'm doing it in a weird way. So you don't have to do things this way, okay? I'm gonna derive a formula for you. So just check this out, but then you just have to know how to use the formula. So, okay, instead of writing two plus two, I'm gonna write two times two. I'm trying to add all the numbers, but instead of writing two plus two, I'm writing two times two, that's still four, but I'm writing it like this. The number that's outside uh, the parentheses is the number you see in the bag, and the number in the parentheses is how many times we see it there. So this says there's two of the number two, okay? And then we see the number, in the th the number three in the bag one time. It's just a weird way of me writing two plus two plus three plus, now I'm gonna write, instead of writing five plus five plus five plus five, I'm gonna write five is in there four times. And then eight is in there three times. That top, if you calculate, it's still me adding them all. It's just in a slightly weird way. And then you're supposed to divide by 10. Now there's a property in, uh, there's a couple of rules in algebra. You don't have to worry about if you know them or not, but let me just tell you real quick. If you have a fraction like this where there's addition on top and there's one number on the bottom, you can put the number underneath each term that's being added. So you can write two times two all over 10 plus three times one all over 10 plus five times four all over 10 plus eight times three all over 10. Let's keep going. Now the next thing is uh, another rule of algebra says that if you have multiplication on top, see there's multiplication up here, and one number on the bottom, you can't put it underneath each thing separately, that's wrong. But you can pick one of the two things on top and put it under one of them. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the 10 and I'm gonna put it under each number that's in the parentheses. So the first term is gonna be two, and then in parentheses, two over 10 plus. Next one, I'm gonna write the three, and put the 10 inside the parentheses, one over 10. Next one is five, parentheses, four over 10. Last one is eight parentheses, three over 10. Okay, this is still the average of all the numbers in the bag, but I wrote it in a weird way. But now the idea is if you didn't see this, but you just had this, could you go from this to this? Do you see a pattern is what I'm asking you. Take a look at the table and compare it to this. And do you see something? Do you guys see anything? What I want you to notice is this first term here is what you get when you multiply those. The second term here is what you get when you multiply those. Third term is what you get when you multiply those. Fourth term, multiply those. So basically what you do to find the average of all the numbers in the bag, even if you can't see the numbers in the bag, you multiply the numbers in each row and then add them up and that will give you the average of all the numbers in the bag. And we call that the expected value. And the formula for that is gonna, Oh, let's see, oh, I had more room here. Okay, anyway, formula for expected value is this. Don't worry about these. This is just notation from some other books. But we're gonna use the symbol mu for average for expected value. And the formula is this, sum of x, p of x. x is the number in the left column of the table, p is the number in the right column. So you multiply the number in the, 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 number in the first, the numbers in the first row together. So the x times its probability, do that for every row and then add them up and that'll give you the expected value. That'll give you the average of all the numbers in the back. Okay, so I kind of showed you where that formula came from. Now, I'm not, going to give, I'm not going to derive the formula for standard deviation and variance, but let me just give them to you. The formula for standard deviation, again, don't worry about this notation, but this is the symbol we're going to use for standard deviation. Here's the formula. 
it looks almost like this. This part here looks almost like this, but the x is squared. Okay, so if we take a closer look, you're supposed to square the x, then multiply by its probability. Do that for each row and add them up. That's what that says. Then you're supposed to minus mu, mu squared. What's mu? It's over here. It's the expected value. So whatever answer you got to that, minus that squared, and then you take the square root. We'll do, we'll do an example in a minute. After you calculate the standard deviation, you calculate the variance very easy. The symbol for variance is sigma squared. Don't worry about this notation. And if you needed a formula, you don't need a formula because you just take this answer and square it. But if you needed a formula for it, you know, if you square this formula, it'll, the square will cancel out the root and you just get everything without the root is what it is. So that's a formula if you needed it, but you don't need it. Uh, okay, and then um, one thing I want you to understand is we have two symbols for means, two symbols for standard deviation, two symbols for variance. Why am I using these symbols? Why am I using, using mu, sigma, and sigma squared instead of x bar, s, and s squared? The reason is because when you're dealing with random variables, the bag of numbers you get, I want you to imagine it's population data, not sample data. So since it's population data, these are the symbols we're going to use. And then when it, I didn't derive the formula for standard deviation, but this formula for standard deviation of all the numbers in the bag comes from this formula for standard deviation. Remember, we had two formulas for standard deviation, one if it's sample data, one if it's population data. This is the formula for sample data standard deviation where you divide by n minus one. The formula for population data, you divide by n, not n minus one. And I'm just, even though I didn't derive the formula, I'm letting you know that this formula was derived by assuming we're gonna divide by n. That's why we're using sigma. We're treating it as population data is what I'm saying there. Let's see what this problem says. You and a friend are betting on the roll of a die. Specifically, you'll lose a dollar if you roll a one, two, or three. You'll lose $2 if you roll a four or five. And you win $8 if you roll a six. Let the random variable x denote the amount of money you win when playing the game once. Find the probability distribution of x. Okay, so we're gonna make a table. And you want to be crystal clear on what the experiment is. So what we're doing is we're rolling a die, rolling one die, okay? But the numbers here are not one, two, three, four, five, six. Some people might do that. Yeah, those are the numbers on the die. But you got to read what your variable is. It says X is the amount of money you win. So the amount of money you win has to go here, not the numbers on the die. So again, don't get confused between outcomes and values of X, okay? So these are the outcomes, but that's not what goes there. So what does it say? It tells you you can lose a dollar in certain situation, you can lose $2 in another situation, or you can win $8 in another situation. What numbers go here? Anyone tell me? Uh, minus one, minus two, uh, and then $8, sorry. Minus $1, minus $2, and then $8. Yeah, exactly. So again, we're rolling a die, Think of what the outcomes are. Then X is the amount of money you win. Think of all those amounts. So read carefully what X is, the amount of money you, win, you can win, all the different amounts of money you can win go here. Then we gotta find the probabilities of each of these things. So that's when you go back to the sample space. Even though there's three different amounts of money you can win, uh, there's six outcomes when you roll a pair of dice. Oh, sorry, when you roll a single die. So all the denominators are gonna be six. Now to get the top number, probability the amount of money you win is negative a dollar. This is probably the amount of money you win is negative two dollars. Probably the amount of money you win is eight dollars. Okay, let's do the first one. Probably the amount of money you win is a negative. So what's the problem? You lose a dollar. You have to tell me all the ways you can lose a dollar. Well, it says you're gonna lose a dollar if you roll a one, two, or three. So how many ways is that? Three. Three, so three on top, yeah. Then it says, you'll lose $2 if you roll a four or five. How many ways is that? Two. Two. Last one says, you'll win $8 if you roll a six. There's only one way to roll a six if you roll a six. So you have to go back to the sample space, back to the experiment, back to what's the experiment? We're rolling a single die and there's six outcomes. Which of those will produce a loss of a dollar? Which of those so these will produce a loss of a dollar, these will produce a loss of two dollars, this will produce a win of six dollars, and then that'll help you figure out what the top numbers are. Okay, so that's the probability distribution. Questions on the probability distribution part? All right, let's go to part B. 
Uh, okay, part B says find the expected value standard deviation and variance uh, of the random variable. So let's find the expected value first. So symbol is mu, formula is sum little x times probability capital X equals little x. But all you need to remember is multiply the numbers in the first row, then multiply the numbers in the second row, and then multiply the numbers in the third row. And then add them up. So multiply all the numbers in the first row, multiply the numbers in the second row, multiply the numbers in the third row, and then add them up. Okay, and when you're done with this, be careful when you type this in the calculator, okay? When you're typing a negative, that's all the way on the bottom, uh, basically bottom right of your calculator. Don't type the subtraction symbol accidentally because then it'll give you an error. All right, let me give you the answer for now. You guys can check that I'm right later. Um, See, I'm getting, basically I'm getting 17 cents. Now, it, if the random variable has units, in this case it's in dollars, then the expected value will also be in the same units, so please don't forget the units. And the answer I have on my calculator is 0.166, a lot of sixes, but because it's dollars, I'm rounding it to 17 cents like that. Oh, because that's expected value. Any questions on the expected value? Okay, let's do the standard deviation. Now, even if you get the uh, part, so first of all, make sure you get part A right, okay, on the quiz. If I ask you to find the, the probability distribution, if you, get this, if you get these numbers wrong, it's all over for part B, because all the calculations in part B depend on this table. So take your time, make sure the table's right. Then, even if you get the table right, a lot of times students will get the expected value right, but then they mess up on the standard deviation. I don't know why, so let's talk about it. Standard deviation, the formula is sum of x squared times probability of capital X equals little x. And it's minus mu squared and then squared of all this. What you do is you first, so what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to square the x, then multiply by the probability. So the first term is going to be negative 1 squared times 3 over 6. So you square the x, you don't square the probability. And then you, you add, and you do this for all the terms. So now you square this number, and you multiply by the probability. So negative 2 squared times 2 over 6, plus the next term you square the x and multiply by its probability. So square the 8, multiply by 1 over 6. So I'm not done there, but this part here basically looks like this, except the very first parentheses in each term you're squaring. Okay, so you do that. Then you have to minus, that takes care of this part. Now you got to minus mu squared. Mu is this. But I'm not going to write 0.17. I'm going to write 0.166. It was, because 0.17 is uh, rounded. Okay, so use the number on the calculator, the unrounded answer. Uh, that's one thing. Don't use the 0.17. Use the 0.1666, a lot of sixes. Don't forget to square it. A lot of students forget to square this number. It's squared. So please don't forget it and then you take the square root after. Okay, so I'll let you type this on the calculator, you know, after class and whatever, but uh, another thing to tell you, I've mentioned this to you before, second day of class, when you're squaring a negative, the negative goes away, but if you don't type it in right, it won't go away. So you have to type it exactly the way I've written here. If you look at this one, the negative is in the parentheses, the square is outside the parentheses. So make sure the negative is inside, the square is outside. Now, a little bit of advice for you, is you know that this negative is going to go away because we're going to square it. Since it's going to go away, my advice to you is don't even type it in. Even though it's negative, don't type in the negative sign. Just put 1 squared. Don't, don't put negative 1 squared. Because if you type negative 1 in and you type it in wrong and you square it and you get a negative, it's going to mess up your answer. But you know it's just going to go away, so you might as well not type it in. So that negative right there and this negative here, I would not type in. If your expected value is negative, sometimes it is, then you'll have a negative inside here. So if you have a negative inside of any of these parentheses that are being squared, I wouldn't type it in at all. This, however, though, this minus sign that's in the formula, you definitely have to type that in. 
but that should be the only one you type in. Type in a subtraction sign. I would not type in any of the other negatives. Just some advice. And then I would do the square root at the end. So this is what I'm doing. So I'm doing one squared times three over six plus two squared times two over six plus eight squared times one over six minus point one six 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 squared answer. And then I'm gonna take the square root at the end. The way you take the square root at the end is you do second square root, second answer. We've done that before. Second root, second answer, 3.53. Um, that's how you find the standard deviation. Any questions on standard deviation? All right, let's do the um, variance real quick. Variance is real easy. Once you do have the standard deviation, it's easy. The notation is sigma squared, and all you do is you square this number that you just got for the standard deviation, you square this. But don't just square 3.53, square the whole thing that's on your calculator. And I have 12.4722. Okay, we still have more parts of this problem to do, but we're almost done. But let me just say this much for now. When the variable has units, so it's in dollars, then expected value be in dollars and the standard deviation will also be in dollars. The variance will not be in dollars though. So for that one, I don't put units and I, I just go to four numbers after the decimal place. That's kind of like our standard rule, go to four numbers after the decimal. Okay, any questions on part B? All right, let's go to part C. Part C says explain the meaning of the expected value. Okay, let me skip that for a second. Let's go to part D. This is a good bet for you. So the way you decide if a gambling game is a good bet for you is you look at the expected value. And the expected value is, is this number, which is a positive number. When the expected value is positive, it means that you're winning on average. If you play, remember, expected value is like an average. So your average winnings is going to be like 17 cents a game. So it's positive. So it's a good get, bet for you. So when I ask you part, a question like part D, is it a good bet for you? So this is a good bet for you. And whenever I ask you this question and I say why, which I'm gonna ask you why on the quiz, there's only one answer I will take because the expected value is positive. If you get a negative expected value, you're gonna write it's a bad bet for you because the expected value is negative. But again, that's the only answer I'll take, okay? so. Again, if it's positive, it's a good bet for you because expected value is positive. Otherwise, it's a bad bet for you because expected value is negative. All right, now, let's talk about how to explain the meaning of that 17 cents. So the expected value was, was this, just to remind you, how to explain the meaning. When you're, so we've talked about how to explain the meaning of probabilities in here, and you're supposed to say if you do something many times. Well, the expected value is calculated from some probabilities, so we're gonna have to talk about many times again. And there's two ways to explain the expected value, depending on if it's a gambling game or if it's not a gambling game. So this one is a gambling game, so I'm gonna, I'll tell you how to explain it. But then um, when you go watch the videos afterwards, there's gonna be at least one example where it's not a gambling game. So make sure you pay attention to that so you know how to explain it in the different situations. Basically what you're gonna say is if you make this bet with a friend many times and you look at your winnings or losses and take like the average per game, you're going to be winning about this much per game. So here's how we're going to write this down. So if you make this bet many times. For gambling games, I'm going to have you write it's as if. And that kind of gets rid of a lot of words. But the word average is in there. Sometimes students write the word average, it's good. It'll average out to as if this happens. That's fine if you do that, that's even better, but I won't make you do that. If you make this bet many times, it's as if you win. Why am I writing win? Because expected value is positive. Don't forget to put about, about 17 cents per, per bet or per game. Let's put per game. Make sure you guys understand that's a per game average is what that is. So if you were to play this game over and over again, forget what happens along the way. I know you're gonna lose a dollar sometimes, lose $2, win $8. 
But instead of that, forget it. Just pretend that every single time you make the bet, your friend hands you 17 cents. Okay, so, so every single time, 17 cents. I know it's not going to feel that way for a little while, but after you played many times, let's say you played this game a million times, then it's as if your friend handed you 17 cents a million times. So you'll be up very close to $170,000, basically what that means. So that's the idea there. When it comes to like bets in Vegas, almost all of them, pretty much all of them, have negative expected values. So when it comes to Vegas, they don't really care who wins and who loses. They just care that people keep playing. So if the expected value on a game is negative 17 cents, then they just want people to, people to keep playing. Every single time you play, it's like you handed them 17 cents. You might win, someone else might lose, but it'll average out at the end of the year as if, you know, let's say someone played the game, you know, a million times. It's like they were handed 17 cents a million times. That's the idea. Example five. It says you're going to draw a single ball from the bag that's over here and let X be the number that you drew in the bag, drew from the bag. And then it says, okay, find the probability distribution of X, find the expected value standard deviation and variance of X, and explain the meaning of the expected value that you found in part B. And it says, hint, some calculations were of, for this problem were already done in, this, uh, in the lecture notes. So I know I did them already in the lecture notes, but I'm going to just go ahead and do them again. So let's go ahead and look at part A. So part A says find the probability distribution of X. When you make a probability distribution for a discrete random variable, chapter six is about discrete random variables. Chapter seven is about continuous random variables. I know we haven't talked about what those mean yet. I'm gonna wait till chapter seven to tell you. But when you're trying to find the probability distribution for a discrete random variable, you're gonna make a table. Okay, so we're gonna make a table and it's gonna have two columns. The first column up here, you're gonna label it with an X. Second one, you're going to write probability capital X equals little x. Okay, then you have to pay attention to what the experiment is and what the random variable is. The experiment is that we're going to draw one number out of this bag, and the random variable is the number we get. So you have to think, okay, well, what are the different values of the random variable? Once you figure out what they are, you put them in, in this spot. All the different possible values of your random variable. In this case, all the different numbers we could draw out of the bag. So you just list the different numbers that we can draw out of the bag. Now, when you list them, don't list them more than once, okay? So we know the number two can come out and there's two different twos. Don't write the number two twice. So, okay, so we're gonna put two because two is the number I can get out of the bag. What else can we get out of the bag? Okay, we can get threes, fives, and eights. Those are the numbers that can come out of the bag. Okay, then on the right side of the table, we're gonna write down the probability of getting those numbers. The notation for this one would be probability capital X equals two. In other words, what is the probability that the, remember what X stands for? X stands for the number that I draw out of the bag. So it's saying, what's the probability that the number I draw out of the bag is two? So you just look in the bag. What's the probability of drawing the number two? You see there's two twos, 10 total, 10 numbers total. So this probability is two out of 10. Okay, what's the probability of drawing a three? You look in the bag and you go, okay, there's only one way I can draw a three. So one out of 10 here, because there's 10 numbers total. What's probably drawing a five? You see there's four fives in the bag, so it's four out of 10. And they're probably drawing an eight. You see there's three eights, three out of 10. So that's how you find the probability distribution. I don't want you to make the mistake that I mentioned a couple times in class of thinking, oh, there's four different things that can come out of the bag and each one has the same chance, so each one has 25% chance. It doesn't have, they don't have 25% chance each because you're assuming that they have the same chance. They don't because there's more of certain ones than other ones. Like there's only one three in the bag, but there's four or five, so there's way more chance of getting a five than there's a three. So you have to look in the bag and then from there you can decide what the probabilities are. Okay, the notation, I guess I forgot to write the notation here. The notation for this one is probability capital X equals three. Remember that X is the number on the ball. So this is the probability that the number that I draw is three. That's what it says there. The notation for this one, probability that a number I draw is five. And this is probability number I draw is eight. So that's just notation. Okay, so that's how you make the probability distribution. One more time, remember, when, when you're finding the probability distribution, be careful, make sure you get it right. Because then when I ask you to calculate the expected value 
standard deviation and variance of the random variable. If these numbers are wrong, then you're going to get those numbers wrong because expected value, standard deviation, and variance depends on this table here. Okay, so let's do the second part of the question. Okay, so it says to find the expected value, standard deviation, and variance of x. In order to find it, we need the probability distribution, which I just erased. I'm going to go ahead and make the table again over here. So here's what it was. We had two columns. You put x in the first column. You put probability capital X equals little x in the second column. The first column is all the different numbers you can get out of the bag. So we have 2, 3, 5, and 8. And then the probabilities go in the second column. The probability of drawing a 2 was 2 out of 10. Probably drawing a 3 was 1 out of 10. Probably drawing a 5 is 4 out of 10. And the probably drawing an 8 was 3 out of 10. Okay, so there's the table. Please make sure that when you're making the probability distribution table that you take care that you have it completely correct. Because if there's anything wrong in the table, then when you calculate the expected value, standard deviation, and variance, all your numbers are going to be wrong. But okay, so now that we have that, to find the expected value, well, the symbol for it is mu. And the formula for the expected value is sum of x, little x there, times probability capital X equals little x. All this formula really means is you're going to take the numbers in the first row and multiply them together. Then you're going to take the numbers in the second row and multiply them together. Then you take the numbers in the third row and multiply them together. Then take the numbers in the fourth row and multiply them together. And then add them all after that. If you write this out, it looks like this. We have, it's going to be 2 times 2 over 10 plus 3 times 1 over 10 plus 5 times 4 over 10 plus 8 times 3 over 10. So that's basically all you do. You just put that in the calculator. And when you're done, your answer should be 5.1. Yeah, so that's it. Let me summarize that here real quick. So the expected value is 5.1. Expected value. Now, let me just talk about units real quick. If your random variable has units, or another way to say it is if these numbers here had units, like if this was $2, $3, $5, that kind of thing, then your expected value answer would also have the same units. That would be $5.1, for example. But in this problem, there's no units at all because the numbers are just the numbers that are written on the balls that are in the bag. There's no unit at all, so your expected value doesn't have any units here. But please don't forget to put the units. If X does have units, then you have to put units for your mu. Okay, so that's how you find the expected value. Now let's go ahead and find uh, the standard deviation. Okay, so to find the standard deviation of the random variable, we have a different formula. The symbol is sigma, and the formula is sum of x squared, that's a little x again, probability capital X equals little x, minus mu squared, and then the square root of all that. All right, so here's what this means. What you're gonna do is you're gonna find a sum, this first part here, this part here, sum of x squared p of x, that means you're going to square this number and then multiply it by this. Don't square the probability, square the first number, the 2, and then multiply by 2 over 10. Then you're going to square the 3 and multiply by 1 over 10. Don't square the 1 over 10, just square the 3. Then you square the 5, then multiply by 4 over 10. Then square the 8, multiply by 3 over 10, and add all those up. And that's what this sum part is. Let me just write down that much first. So it's going to be 2 squared times 2 over 10. You notice I squared the 2. I don't square the 2 over 10. Plus the next term is going to be 3 squared times 1 over 10. Next term is going to be 5 squared times 4 over 10 plus 8 squared times 3 over 10. Now there's more to do than this, so I'm not done there, but I'm going to have to raise the table since I ran out of room there. But that's the first part. That takes care of the sum part. Okay, so we just did this part here, the sum. Okay, so let me go ahead and erase this table now. Okay, so now we have to minus mu squared. Okay, mu is the expected value that we found on the last slide, that was the mu, okay, mu's expected value, which was 5.1. So now what you're gonna do is you're gonna minus 
the mu squared, 5.1 squared. Don't forget the power 2 there. A lot of times students forget the power 2. They write minus 5.1, but they don't square it. So don't forget to square it. And then after you do this sum and then you minus the 5.1 squared, you take the square root of that whole thing. Okay, when you type that in the calculator, the answer is 2.211. Okay, so let me just write that here. This, that we have sigma is 2.211, and that's the standard deviation. Once again, if x has units, then mu and sigma will all have the same units. But in this problem, there are no units, so there's no units for sigma either. Okay, so that's how you find the standard deviation. Guys, please practice calculating the standard deviation because students always mess up when they calculate the standard, standard deviation of random variables. I have no idea why, but people mess up all the time. So practice that, make sure you're able to come up with the 2.21. Okay, the only thing left to do is to find the variance, right? We found the standard deviation here, that was sigma. To find the variance, you have to find sigma squared. All that means is you take the answer we just got and square it. Let me put that over here. Okay, so sigma squared, you just square the 2.211 answer we got. Now you shouldn't actually square the 2.211, 2.211 was rounded. So if you still have that number on your calculator, you wanna square the number that's on your calculator. So I'm gonna put these dots, meaning there was more digits that I'm not writing out, and you square that. And when you're done, you get sigma square equals 4.89. That's the variance. Okay, so that's how you find the variance of the random variable. Okay, so please guys, make sure you practice calculating that standard deviation. That one's a tough one. A lot of students mess it up, so practice that. All right, so let's go on to part C of this example now. Okay, so here it's asking you to explain the meaning of the expected value that we got in part B. Okay, so just so you know, I'm never going to ask you to explain the meaning of the standard deviation or the variance of a random variable, but I will ask you to explain the meaning of the expected value. For this problem, we just calculated the expected value, and the expected value was 5.1. So we're going to explain what the meaning of that is. Now, before I explain the meaning of this one, let me just point out that if it's a gambling game, there's one way to say it, and then if it's a game like this where we're not gambling, there's a slightly different way that I'm going to have you say it. So real quick, let me just remind you of the one we did in class. So before I do this one, the one we did in class, the mu, it was a, we we're betting on rolling a die and the mu was 17 cents. So the way I had you say this one is I said, okay, if you make the bet with this on, of rolling a die with your friend many times, it's as if you win 17 cents per game. And what do I mean by it's as if you win 17 cents per game? You can never win 17 cents in any individual game in that example, but if you play many times, like a thousand times, a million times, that kind of thing, and then if you forget how much you could win per game and just pretend that you're winning 17 cents per game, then that's about what will happen to you. So if you play uh, that game a million times, just forget what happened and pretend that you won 17 cents a million times. And that's about how much money you'll have at the end when you play a million times. So that's how you say it when it's a gambling game. But when it's not, like this one, then how do you say it? Um, so, I mean, the 5.1, what it really is, is the average of these numbers here. If you took the average of all of them, you'd get 5.1. But there's going to be problems where you can't even see the numbers in the bag. You know, we're going to have random variables, and I tell you to think about it as numbers in a bag, but it may not be numbers in a bag. So what does the 5.1 really mean? Here's what it means. It means if you draw, I'm gonna say it fast once and then I'll say it slow so you can write it down. Um, actually, I'll, I'll write it instead of say it slow. So here's the idea. So if you draw a number from this bag many times, so imagine you draw a number from this bag, write it down, draw a second number and then put it back in, then draw a second number from this bag, write it down, put it back in, draw a third number from this bag, write it down. And you do that, I don't know, thousands of times. So, you know, for example, let's say you go ahead and you draw two, the second time you draw eight, third time you draw five, fourth time you draw an eight, fifth time you draw two, and you do this a lot of times, let's say you did it a million times, and the very last time you get uh, a five. Then if you take the average of these numbers after you've done it a million times, the average is gonna be about 5.1. It might not be exactly 5.1, but it's gonna be about 5.1. Why about 5.1? Well, you know, if you do it a thousand times, you expect it to be somewhat close to 5.1, 
but if you did it a million times, you expect it to be much closer to 5.1. If you do it a thousand times, maybe your answer for your average of these numbers here is, you know, 5.8. But if you do it a million times, you expect it to be something like 5.11, something much closer to 5 than 5.1 to 5.1. Okay, so let me say it one more time fast, and then I'll write it down. So if you draw a number from the bag many times. And take the average of the numbers that you got, the average of the numbers that you got will be about 5.1. So, okay, let me go ahead and write that one down. Let me say it one more time. If you draw a number from this bag many times and take the average of all the numbers that you drew, the average will be about 5.1. Let's write that down. So, if you draw a number from this bag, many times and take the average of the numbers you drew the average will be about 5.1. So I know that one's a little bit weirder than the gambling one, but that's the way it's going to happen when it's not a gambling game. That's how you're going to write it down. Okay, so we got one more example, guys. Let's go ahead and look at the next example. In this example, we're going to look at two bets that you can make in roulette. So I thought this was a fun problem to do, so I said, well, why not put it in the video? So there's two different bets we're going to make. The first bet, we're going to bet $100 on red. And then X is going to stand for how much money we make if we make this bet. And then the second bet, we're going to bet $100 again. But we're not going to bet on red. We're going to bet on just the number 28. That's my wife's birthday, by the way. When I play roulette, that's the number I bet on, if you're wondering why I picked 28. And it comes up, so it's pretty good. Um, OK, so anyway, the first bet, we're betting on red. And we're going to win if any, if the ball lands in any red slot, we're going to win. Whereas for bet two, we're betting $100 on just one number. We're only going to win if the number 28 comes. In other words, if the ball lands in the number 28 slot. Otherwise, we lose. So we're going to win this bet way more often than this bet. Because there's a lot of ways we can it can land on red. There's 18 red numbers. Whereas here, there's only one way it can land on 28. There's only one slot that's got a 28 on it. There's 18 slots that are red, but only one that's 28. So now what I want you to do is for both of these bets, I want you to figure out the probability distribution for these bets, find the expected value, variance, and standard deviation for these random variables, explain the meaning, and then we'll see which bet is better. OK, so x is what I'm going to denote for how much money you win if you make the first bet, if you bet on red. Y, I'll just use a different letter. Y is going to be how much money you win if you bet $100 on 28. Okay, so here's a roulette table. Okay, so there's a picture of a roulette wheel just real quick just to get us in the mood. And um, we're betting. So one bet is you bet on red. Okay, so there's red. You would put the bet there. If it lands in any one of these red slots, that one or that one or that one or any one, you would win. And the other bet is we're just betting on the number 28 only. So only if the ball lands in this slot here, that's the 28th slot, then we win. Otherwise, we lose. Okay, so let's go ahead and do this. Part A says find the probability distributions for X and Y. Okay, so for X, here's what we have. X, probability, capital X equals little x. Remember, this is a, sorry, this is a lowercase x. looks kind of funny. You have to think about what your random variable is. It's the amount of money you win if you bet on red. Well, what happens if you bet on red? If you bet $100 on red, do you know what happens? Only two things can happen. Either the ball lands in a red slot, and if it lands in a red slot, you're going to win $100. bucks. you are going to win whatever the amount is that you bet. Or the ball doesn't land on a red slot, which means it landed in a black slot or a green slot, and then you're going to lose the $100 that you bet. Now, sometimes people get confused because when it comes to gambling, you put the money out there when you bet, 
and then you win or lose and they pay you if you win and take your bet if you lose. But the question says it's the amount of money you win. So when I say you win, the amount your bet is, that's what you win. That's not, they don't just give you back your hundred bucks. They give you back your hundred bucks and then they give you another hundred on top. So one more time, if you bet a hundred dollars on red and you win, they will end up giving, so you'll have to give them the hundred dollars to make the bet. And then they'll give back to you 200. They'll give you your hundred that you bet back. They'll just give it back to you. And then they'll give you another hundred because you won a hundred dollars. So they're going to give you back 200, but that's not how much you won. You won a hundred. Okay. So the amount of money you win is what your bet is. You win a hundred dollars. So that's one possible value of X. You could win a hundred. It's got units. So I'm going to put a dollar sign there. So you could win a hundred. And if the ball doesn't land in a red slot, then you're going to use, lose your bet. So you're going to put negative a hundred. So that's what can happen to you if you make this bet. You either win $100, $100 profit, or $100 loss. You give them the $100 when you make your bet, and they keep it if it doesn't land on a red slot. Okay, now let's go ahead and find the probabilities. And again, you don't want to do something like this. You don't want to say, hey, there's two outcomes over here, so it's got to be 50-50. That's definitely wrong because it's more likely for it to not land in red than for it to land in red. How many ways are there for it to land in red? You have to, that's what you have to think. Or another way to say it is, if I want to find the probability that X is 100, okay, so the notation for this right here would be probability capital X equals $100, or the, what's the probability I win $100? Well, you have to go, how can you win $100? You win $100 if the ball lands in a red slot. So how many are there? There's 18 red slots, and there's 38 total. So that's the probability of the ball landing in red. Okay, for this one... This is the probability capital X equals negative $100, which is the probability you lose $100. So you have to think, how could you lose $100? So the way you lose $100 is if the ball lands in a black slot or a green slot, or another way to say it is any slot besides the red slots. How many slots is that? That's 20. If you're like, where'd you get the 20 from? Well, I'm counting the 18 black slots and the two red slots. That gives me 20. Or another way to say it is, if there's 18 red and 38 total, so 18 red, 38 total, how many are left that are not red? You subtract and you get 20. Okay. So that's the probability distribution for X. Okay, now let's go ahead and talk about Y. The thing is, if I didn't tell you this information and you don't know anything about roulette, then you'll have a little bit of trouble coming up with the Y's probability distribution. All right, so when you make your probability distribution for Y, remember, you're going to make a two-column table. I'm going to put a lowercase Y here and a capital Y here, but almost always it's going to be X, little X and, sorry, this is not going to be Y, got that wrong. This is supposed to be the probability, capital Y equals little Y. Okay, so most of the time we're going to use X's, but just because I have two random variables in this problem, one's X, one's Y, so we'll write it like that. Okay, so how does roulette work when you bet on one number? If you bet on $100 on just the number 28, if you win, if the ball lands in the number 28 slot, you're not gonna just win 100 bucks. You're gonna win way more, and that's why that bet's more exciting, because when you hit it, you win a lot of money. And the rule is you win 35 times your bet. So let me go ahead and write that over here. So if you win, you win, 35 times your bet. That's how much you win. So what I'm trying to tell you is if you bet $100 on the number 28, if the ball lands in the number 28, you're going to win $3,500. Now, that's how much you win. That's not how much they're going to give you. They're going to give you $3,600 because what you're going to do is you're going to give them 100 and then when you win, they're going to give you back your 100 and then they're going to give you an extra 3500 so the 3500 is how much you won, even though they technically are giving you back 3600 Okay, and X, uh, Y stands for how much money you win when you make that bet. Okay, and then if you lose, of course, you're going to lose the 100 that you gave them. Okay, so here's how it works. Either you win 3500 so it's a positive 3500 or you lose 100 Now, let's go ahead and find the probabilities of these things. Well, the notation here for this probability, this is the probability 
the capital Y equals 3,500. Sorry, this is a little small. Remember, Y is the amount of money you win when you make that second bet. Was it probably that if I make the second bet, the amount of money I win is $3,500? Again, it's not 50-50 because there's two different options for Y. It doesn't work like that. Because you understand the chance that you win is very small. It has to land on 28 and that's it. So what is the probability? You have to ask yourself, how can I win 3,500? I can win 3,500 if the ball lands in the number 28. And there's only one way for that to happen. There's only one slot with the number 28 on it. So probably is one out of 38. Because there's 38 slots total. So there's only one way for you to win. Well, then what's the probability you lose? Well, any of the other 37 slots you're going to lose. So 37 out of 30 is the probability you lose. Okay, so there are the two probability distributions for the different bets. Okay, let's go ahead and find the expected value for each. Okay, so to find the expected value, variance and standard deviation of these random variables, we're gonna need the tables that are now erased. Let me go ahead and put them again here. So for X, it was that you could either win 100 or lose 100. The probability of winning 100 was 18 out of 38. Probably losing 100 was 20 out of 38. That was for the, the X bet, the one where we just bet $100 on red. And then the table for the Y bet looked like this. So you could either win 3,500 or you lose 100. This is the bet where you bet on the number 28 only. And if you win, you win 3,500 and if you don't land on 28, you lose the 100. The probability of winning the 3,500 was 1 out of 38. The probability of losing 100 was 37 out of 38. All right, so let's go ahead and find the expected values and for each of these things. Let's start with the, the X bet. So I'm going to call it mu with an X down here. Now, you don't have to do that, but that's just so I can distinguish it between is it the mu for x that I'm finding or the mu for y? The formula is sum of x probability capital X equal x, like that. Okay, but what does that mean? It means you multiply the numbers in the first row together. So you can multiply these numbers together, then multiply these together, and then add them all. So what you get, you do, okay, so you do 100 times 18 out of 38 and then plus negative 100 times 20 out of 38 and when you calculate that you get negative now it's in dollars remember when the random variable has units this the expected value and the standard deviation also has the same units so this is also going to be in dollars and the answer is negative five dollars and 26 cents Okay, so that's for the, the bet where you're betting on red. Okay, um, I don't want to say much about the meaning until we get there, but let me just say that it's basically like if you keep making this bet, the casino doesn't really care if you're going to win or lose along the way. It'll just pretend that you lose $5.26 every time you make the bet. So every time you put your hand on the table to make the bet, forget doing that and just imagine you hand it over to the casino $5.26. If you can just imagine that happening instead, if you play a long time, that's about how much you're going to be down. Okay, we'll talk more about it in a minute. Let's go ahead and find the expected value for the Y bet. So I'm going to call that mu Y. I guess the formula, I'm supposed to put Y is in here, and then this will be a lowercase Y here, and this probability capital Y equals little Y. But anyway, it's the same idea. You're going to multiply the numbers in the first row together then multiply the numbers in the second row together and then add them all up. So you're going to get 3,500 times 1 out of 38 plus negative 100 times 37 out of 38. And the answer is, put in the calculator, you get negative $5.26 again. You might be going, wait, Greg, that doesn't make sense. You must have made a mistake or something. No, I didn't make a mistake. The expected value is negative $5, $5.26. It turns out in roulette, if you bet $100, no matter what bet you make, 
the, the expected value is always going to be negative five dollars and 26 cents whether you bet on red black even odd uh first 12 second 12 third 12 first row second row or column first row first column second column third column if you bet on only one number or only, or two numbers or three numbers or four numbers or six numbers any of those things if you're betting a hundred dollars your expected value is negative five dollars and 26 cents there's actually one bet in roulette you can make where you bet on five numbers all at once and that one actually has a slightly worse expected value but other than that they all have the same expected value now what i want to do is i want to kind of figure out which bet is a better bet um first of all i want to say a couple things i don't condone gambling i don't recommend anyone go gamble if you uh, you know, people get in a lot of trouble gambling, so I really advise against gambling. Um, if you do want to gamble for fun, you know, you need to make sure you can control yourself and not lose money you can't afford, that kind of thing. If it's for fun, then I guess you can view it the same way as like going to the movies. You go to the movies and you spend money. You go and gamble and you spend money as long as you don't lose that much money, you know. So, again, I advise you not to gamble. And over here, the other thing is... Um, the expected values are negative so they're both bad bets in the, in the sense that when you place the bet it's as if you're just giving the money to the casino you're giving them five dollars and 26 cents per game just forget playing the game imagine handing them five dollars and 26 cents every so often and that's basically what you're doing so from the expected values alone you can't really tell which one's a better bet again they're both bad but i still want to get an idea of okay even though they're bad which one's more bad or that kind of thing which one's a little bit less bad than the other one so the way we're going to do that here is we're going to look at the standard deviations. Okay, so now I'm going to calculate the standard deviation for each of these things. I'm going to go ahead and write down the mu here real quick. So the mu we got for x is negative $5.26. The mu we got for y, same thing, negative $5.26. Okay, let's erase some stuff and get ready to find the, sta the standard deviations. Okay, so to find the standard deviation for x, I'm going to call it sigma with a little x here, just to distinguish it from the standard deviation for y. The formula is sum of x squared probability capital X equal little x, then it's minus mu squared, and then the square root of this whole thing here. So what does that mean? What it means is you're going to go and you're going to square this first number, then multiply it by this, then square this number and multiply it by this, and add them, and that'll give you this part of the answer. Let's do that part first. So we're gonna do 100 squared times 18 out of 38 plus negative 100 squared times 20 out of 38. Okay, then after you do that, then you're gonna do this minus mu squared term, where you're just gonna minus the expected value. I'm talking about this expected value that we found earlier. So minus that squared, so I have to put a negative 5.26 squared in here. And then once you find that whole thing, you take the square root of everything. And the answer that we get for this, if you plug in the calculator, uh, actually, before I tell you the answer, let me just say a couple things here. Uh, first of all, try calculating it on your own before I give you the answer, so we make sure that you're able to do it. And the second thing is, remember that when you square something, if there's a negative in there, the negative is going to go away. So when you go to do this term right here, you're going to square the negative 100. The negative will just get squared away. Same thing over here. There's a negative inside this parentheses, and it's going to get squared. So that negative is going to go away. So my advice to you when you type this in the calculators, don't even type those negative signs in. Because if you type it in wrong, you could definitely get the wrong answer. And they're going to get squared away anyway, so just don't even put them. But this sign right here, this is not a negative sign. This is a minus sign. And it's not inside a parentheses that's getting squared. So you will have to type that one in. So when I type this in the calculator, I'm going to type 100 squared times 18 over 38 plus positive 100 squared times 20 over 38 minus parentheses positive $5.26 squared. That's how I'll type it. Okay, and then when we type it in the calculator, okay, here's the answer. Don't forget that since x has units, uh, that mu has the same units and standard deviation has the same units. So the units for this are in dollars. So it's going to be how many dollars? Looks like it's 
and 86 cents if you round a little bit. That's the standard deviation of x. Now it's going to be hard for me to explain the meaning of the standard deviation for the moment, but uh, let's just at least write it down and let's go ahead and find the standard deviation for y. So let's erase some stuff here. So standard deviation for x is $99.86. Okay, now let's go ahead and find the standard deviation for y. Okay, so the symbol I'll use will be sigma with a y. I guess that should be a capital Y down there. It doesn't really matter anyway, but let me just go ahead and write it right. So the formula will be sum. Now, I guess if I'm going to write the formula correctly, I need to put Y's instead of X's. This would be a little Y squared times the probability capital Y equals little Y. And then minus mu squared and then the square root of all that. So once again, in order to calculate this, this is what you're going to do. You're going to find, you're going to do this squared, then multiply by this. Then you can do this squared and multiply by this and add them all. And that'll give you the sum part. So we write that part down first. So it's going to be 3,500 squared times 1 out of 38 plus negative 100 squared times 37 out of 38. That's the sum part. Then you got to minus the mean squared. So it's going to be minus, let's keep it green over here, minus the mean was negative $5.26 squared. Make sure you see the decimal there. Okay, and then you take the square root of all that. And once again, when you type this in, you see some negatives inside of a square, inside of a parentheses, and it's going to get squared. Like over here, it's negative 100 squared, and over here you have a negative something being squared. Sorry, this decimal is not showing up. And that's 5.26 squared. Anyway, I wouldn't type in those two negatives inside the parentheses that are getting squared because they're going to be squared away. And when you square them, it's not going to be negative anyway. So my advice is to not even type them in so you don't make mistakes. But don't forget that this one here absolutely has to be typed in because it's not inside of parentheses that's getting squared. Okay, so one more time. When I type this in, I'm going to be typing 3,500 squared times 1 over 38 plus positive 100 squared times 37 over 38 minus positive 5.26 squared. And then once we get that answer, we'll take the square root of that. Okay, so put in the calculator and you get, remember it has units again, so it's going to be dollars. So we get $576.26. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and write that over here. Sigma Y equals $576.26. Okay, so now at least I have something that distinguishes the two bets. They both have the same expected value, so they're both bad. They're both as if... If you play these, make these bets long enough, whichever one you make, it's as if you're giving the casino $5.26 per game. That's what the, the mu's stand for. That's for either bet. But notice the standard deviation here is $99, and here it's way higher, $576. All right, so let's talk about what this could mean here. Remember, standard deviation is supposed to measure how spread out things are. In this case, what it does is it measures how... Um, what happens to your money basically when you keep playing for a while does your money get i don't i guess spread out is not the right word maybe does it swing a lot does your money go up and down wildly or is it kind of stay somewhat steady if you can imagine a graph let me erase this up here so i can draw a graph so for this first example here where you're betting on red try to imagine that as i go this way it's my making more bets and if the graph goes up i'm making money if the graph goes down i'm losing money so if you're betting on red $100 every time, and let's say, for example, this is break even right here. So when you start, start making the bets. Okay, maybe you win one, lose one, lose one, win one, lose one, lose one, win, lose, win, win, lose. And your, your money's going like this. 
eventually your money's going to go down. Yeah, maybe you get into a profit, but eventually your money's going to go down because it's like you're giving away $5.26 per game. So you see the money, though, it doesn't go down. It, and, uh, you win a little bit, you lose a little bit. It takes its time going down, but it will eventually go down. Okay, if you look at the other bet, though, what happens if you just bet on the number 28? That's all you do. Let's get rid of this X here. Okay, let's say again this red line is break even, so you haven't won, you haven't lost. Well, here's what's going to happen when you bet 28. It's so hard for it to come up, so here's what's going to happen. Lose. Oops. So it's going to be lose, 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 win. When you win, you're going to win $3,500. You're going to win a lot of money. Then lose, 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 lose. Maybe you win again. Then lose, 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 lose. And you see that your money is swinging much more wildly in the second example. The money's going up and down all over the place in the second example. That's what the standard deviation lets you know. Okay, so it's telling you how is what's going to happen to your money as far as swings go. Are you going to go up and down wildly or are you going to go up and down pretty steadily? That's the idea. So if someone asked you which one's a better bet, well, it depends on your personality, I suppose. From a mathematical standpoint, you would probably say the first one's better, this one over here. And the reason is because your money will last longer. If your money is not swinging wildly, then maybe you can play longer before you lose all your money. Again, anytime you gamble, if you play long enough and you have a negative expected value, you're going to lose all your money eventually. But if the lower the standard deviation is, the longer you can last with that money. That's kind of the idea there. Whereas in the second example here, since the standard deviation is so much bigger, you know, you only have to hit, not hit the 28 enough times and then you lose all your money. Yeah, if you would just hit it once, you'd win a ton of money, but if you don't hit it, then your money's swinging wildly and you can lose all your money right away. So mathematical, from a mathematical standpoint, the first bet's better. Now let me just tell you from a person who likes to play roulette every once in a while, this bet, second one is definitely more fun. It's more fun because when you hit, you hit big. So it gets real exciting. So again, it does depend on your personality. Um, but yeah, you got to be careful making the second bet. You should, if you're going to make a bet like that, you know, don't bet $100. Bet a lot less, of course. Nobody bets $100. That's crazy. But if you're making bets kind of like this, it's really fun when you hit it. But don't play it too often because otherwise you're going to lose all your money really fast. So this one's exciting because there's wild swings. So wild swings makes it exciting. But on the other hand, not having wild swings allows you to play longer. So again, I think if you, if this was in the book, actually this problem probably is in the book. If it's not, it's in a lot of books. Um, it'll say things like the first bet is better because you'll last longer, that kind of thing. Okay, I've really cluttered up this slide over here and I still have to find the variances. I never found them. Let me go ahead and do that here real quick. Okay, I know it's real easy to find the variances, but let's go ahead and do it real quick. So to find the variance for X, all you do, oops, the notation would be like this. All you do is you square the standard deviation. The standard deviation is 99.86 and some other stuff squared. And when you square that, you get, looks like it's 99. 72.299. Now, I'm not going to put units on this because the units for variance are pretty weird. <clears throat> if the random variable is in dollars, then the expected value, standard deviation, are also going to be in dollars. But the variance is going to be in dollar squared. That's the units. And what does dollar squared mean? Yeah, I can't even get my head around that. So I just don't put units there. So that's the variance for that one. And if you're going to find the variance for y, I guess the notation would be sigma y squared. You just square the, the sigma that we found, 576.26 squared, and you get, looks like 332,077.6. Again, I'll just leave off the units there. Yeah, so that's how that goes. I guess to make this thing complete, let me write it down here too. Sigma squared, the variance 
and the variance for y much higher of course because as we said this game there's much more wild swings yeah that's how that one goes okay let's look at the next part of this problem it says explain the meaning of the expected values that you found in part b okay so one more time let me remind you of the expected values that we got they were both the same so i only have to really explain them the game once maybe i'll explain it twice okay so the expected value for x was negative five dollars and 26 cents okay that was for x and the expected value for y was the same thing negative five dollars and 26 cents what does it mean well let's go ahead and explain this one first it means if you bet a hundred dollars on red many times it's as if you lose about five dollars and 26 cents per game that's the way i want you to say it if i ask that on a quiz let me say it one more time if you bet a hundred dollars on red many times maybe we should add in that we're playing roulette okay if you play roulette and bet a hundred dollars on red many times it's as if you lose about five dollars and 26 cents per game you're going to say lose because we have a negative number there let me go ahead and say the one for y so if i want to explain what this expected value means you're going to say if you play roulette and you bet 100 on the number 28 many times it's as if you lose about five dollars and 26 cents per bet or per game okay so that's the idea that's how you're going to say it when it's a gambling game i want you to say it like that let me go ahead and say this second one one more time if you play roulette and bet hundred dollars on the number 28 many times it's as if you lose about five dollars and 26 cents per game so no matter what you do if you're making the first bet or the second bet the casino is going to pretend that they're making five dollars and 26 cents off of you every time you make the bet they're again not going to care what actually happens you might win 20 times in a row start losing you might win and go home you might lose who knows but the point is you're going to play you're going to play a lot when you leave there's going to be someone else to take your place and they're going to play and they're going to play a lot so it's as if somebody's playing many many times so then it's going to average out because remember expected value is an average it's going to average out to be the the casino is going to make right around five dollars and 26 cents per game okay let me go ahead and write it out once bet one here for bet one if i actually explain the expected value you're going to say if you play roulette and bet hundred dollars on red many times it's as if you lose about five dollars and twenty six cents twenty six cents per game okay so that's how you write it out for bet one for bet two, I'm not going to write the whole thing out. I'm just going to basically erase and go ahead and write down what, it, what would be different if you write it down for bet two. So for bet two, so I'm going to erase where it says bet one and put bet two. And what you're going to say is if you play roulette and bet $100 on red many times, instead of red, we're going to be betting 100 on 28. So I'm going to erase that part on number 28 many times the rest is the same it's as if you lose about five dollars and 26 cents per game yeah that's the meaning of the expected value i'm not going to ask you to explain the meaning of the other ones definitely be able to explain the meaning for the expected value be able to explain the meaning of the expected value if it's a gambling game or if it's not a gambling game okay and then the last part says discuss which bet is which one is a better bet we already explained they're both bad but it says discuss so like i said mathematically you'll last longer if you make the first bet <clears throat> but on the other hand if you're looking for excitement where you have big swings then the second one is better but please remember neither of them are good and i don't advise to make these bets i don't advise to, for you to gamble at all because when there's negative expected value it's a losing bet you're giving the casino money 
Um, so that's going to be it for this video. So I hope that made some sense. Uh, guys, study super hard, and I will see you next class.